A premium membership at chess.com will help you improve your game with full access to a powerful set of learning tools. Unlimited tactics let you practice like a master with more than 50,000 puzzles to challenge you at every level. Our library of interactive chess lessons created by master coaches will enhance every aspect of your game. And after each game you play, the computer analysis feature will give you feedback on every move you played, turning every game into a chance to learn. And that's not all. Premium benefits also include unlimited tournaments, video lessons, the opening explorer, and much, much more. Upgrade now to take your game to the next level. Welcome to the final quarterfinal of the 2020 Pro Chess League playoffs. Grandmaster Robert Hess here with my good friend, International Master Levy Rosman. Levy, it's been a fun first three matches to see who gets to the semis. What are your predictions for today and how excited are you to see these players face off? Oh, I'm super excited. Um, I mean, Canada has been, you know, actually this, this entire matchup is really the, the question of who's going to be uh, in the Pro Chess League finals uh, that's not one of our consistent uh, teams. We've had the same three teams for several years now. Uh, and taking a look at the bracket, you know, we'll, we'll see that today we'll either get Canada or Chicago. Uh, you know, before we get into predictions, just Canada has been a, a, their experiment has paid off, Robert, hasn't it? I mean, with all these super GMs. It certainly has because they could rely on trusty Sasha Grishuk playing every single game during the regular season, thus turning into a local player. So for the playoffs, they got to use their three-headed monster of Super Jams and Grishuk, Geary, and Ali Reza Farouja. I think we're going to get into our uh, – oh, let's take a look at the lineups. Yes, of course. Uh, well, I mean, not surprising. This is everything we saw last week with the one change being the board four uh, for Canada. Mr. Chesbra himself is playing, Eric. Uh, well, I, I meant to say Eric Hansen, but <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not calling you Eric. I would not. You're, 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 you're Robert. You know. Sorry. Thank you for, for reminding everybody of who I am. But <laughs> I, on a serious note, I think that switcheroo makes sense because uh, Eric, it's kind of like the blood of the chess bras, right? He is like the founder. He, everybody knows and loves him. And Yvonne Sarge has had some struggles in the pro chess league this season. And on the other side of things with the Chicago wind, they have that more balanced lineup. Some players I would say are underrated, but a very dangerous team. So just because they're outrated on well, every single board by quite a substantial margin with the exception of board four, I do think it's going to be a closer matchup that immediately meets the eye. I think we're going to take a look at our daily question. Um, actually, I was going to ask you something after that but our daily question is the candidates were to be decided by chess boxing who would win and why so robert i, I don't know how, how do you guys usually do this you guys usually wait like you you think of an answer or you do you have an answer right now i do have an answer right now but normally you know i sit and wait on it but just because i wasn't expecting this question i'm gonna go right now immediately with grishuk because <laughs> I, I feel like he's got both the like inner like ability to just throw it down and not have any like sympathy where some of the other players would be like, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Grishuk would just go for it. And he's got a bit of a reach. So I'm going with Sasha. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go with, well, you know, I feel like the, the two choices are pretty obvious here, uh, but I'm going to go with Nepo. Okay. Um, going to, and I'm going to go with Nepo because I, you know, I feel, I feel like Grishuk might, you know, might keep them at bay with the range, but I feel like Nepo can, can take a punch and he's just going to get right up in there. He's like the Daniel Cormier of the candidates, you know, head I, on the chest. And just... I, <laughs> I personally, I like that. But also I was going to say, I do feel like a dark horse in this is Wong Hao because he's going to go a little bit under the radar. He's not very happy with how he's, you know, all his whole dilemma and getting to Russia and, you know, some things just haven't gone his way. So I feel like Wong Hao, he's a pretty sizable guy. He could hang in there. So I feel like I feel like he'd fight a very technical fight. You know, he'd he'd go for the like the outpointing. And remember, we said chess boxing. We didn't just say boxing. So chess boxing, you guys don't know. You need to finish a boxing round, then go back to the chess. So he'd be a good balance of both. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. There's something that tells me that he would be kind of up there with a Grishuk and a Nepo. But I like your pick with Nepo because if this were MMA instead of boxing, I would be more likely to go Nepo. Guys, if you have an answer, make sure I, 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 th this this question really should get a lot of traction. It's a lot of fun, and we picked it because you know obviously this this is going to be uh, you know when the quarterfinals kind of run to their end of these live shows, we do have to wait uh, until the semis and then the finals ultimately. Plus, the candidates are starting soon. I mean, as of right now, 
I, there's going to be no cancellations. Uh, Fabiano Caruana did make it to uh, to Russia ultimately. Um, so Wesley So writing, you know, did did uh, who was it? Did Wang Hao make it? Yeah, Wang Hao not only made it to Russia, he then made it very public that that he's it's he hopes that it's his last time there. Yeah. Um, so it seems like all of our players are there. Uh, and well, you know what? Before our game start, Robert, who is the best candidate to beat Magnus Carlsen in a chess boxing match? Is are the answers all the same? Is it still Nepo? Is it still Grisha? That's a really good question. I think actually Magnus is just the favorite, not even because of the chess. I think because of the boxing. The boxing. Like Mag Magnus is in great shape. So against all of these guys, all these guys, I should say, I'm still taking Magnus. But wow, that's a really good question. I I'm gonna have to think on that answer, and that would have been a that might be the better daily question. Well, people are saying Alexianko. I'm excited, man. I mean, th this is a really fun candidates for for a few reasons. Uh, a lot of players that you know, it's their it's their first run at it. And then other than that, it's also, there, there's just such big names, right? There's a lot of storylines here. I think every single player in the candidates this year has a story, you know, like uh, Fabiano is like, you know, d d the, the guy who like won it last time and by the slimmest of margins, didn't win it the first time, lost to Magnus, but drew 12 games. And uh, we've got the two Chinese players, first of all, uh, then we have, Alexianko, who's this old wild card thing, then the Rajab of an MBL thing. <laughs> yep. Just just crazy, crazy stuff. So um, I mean, one of the, the one of the biggest questions in my eyes is will Nepo be able to slow down? Because when he actually you know, spends his time and isn't rushing, that guy can really compete with the best of them. So uh, Alexander Grishuk, we have his game up as black against Alexander Shamanov. And for Grishuk, I mean that's another good example. He almost qualified for world championship. He lost to Boris Gelfand, and it was very uh, slim margin in that match. So uh, Grishuk would love to make it to a world championship match. I think it'd be a really tough battle in some ways for Carlson. Carlson would be the favorite no matter who he plays. But I do like Grishuk's style of chess. I do. I, I also really like a lot of the styles of the players on the Chicago Wind. Um, <clears throat> like Shimanov. I think the wild card factor for them, uh, maybe this is surprising, maybe not. I think it's Ilya Nizhnik. I mean, for those of you that don't know, Ilya Nizhnik is, is like a household name right now, just, you know, pro chess league and, and high level tournaments alone. I'm not sure the chat knows this. He's one of the youngest grandmasters of all time. Like right. Ilya Nizhnik was supposed to maybe be 27 XX, 27 40, 27 50. Okay. You know, he's still obviously very, very strong, high 2600s. You can argue that he might have been a higher prodigy status, but, you know, he's in university now. He'll ultimately probably have a career outside of chess, but. This guy comes to fight. He always tries to take the game out of theory. And so do a lot of these other guys. Like, look at this. Shimanov just, I don't think this is any sort of theory. This is just a position that he's trying to get against uh, Grishuk. Yeah, it looks very strange. But I, I like the time he's in Grishuk making a face like, what's going on here? I don't, I don't get this. <laughs> I mean, this bishop on g7 looks excellent. Black is fully developed on the queen side. The knight on c6, queen on d7. He'll just move his knight out from g8, castle king side. I see no risk at all in a position like this for Black. So I agree with his almost like a snarl. Like, what, what, what's this guy doing here? And for Shimanov with the hoodie situation going on, he's like, I don't know, he just has this like dark vibe to him right now. Yeah, I was going to say, he looks like a hood, like a, like, like Grishuk in a hoodie. You know, they, <laughs> they, 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 got a, they got similar kind of facial hair going on. Yeah, Shimanov is, is rocking the, uh, the, the poker look, you know? And, uh, but okay, th this is, this is already kind of the first indication of a fight, knight h5. So Grishuk right. not interested in taking on d5 and giving ed5 to his opponent um, with, you know, pressure on the e file. Yeah, so he plays knight h5. Th this is actually a lot of a modern trend in the Sicilian. Early d4, uh, trade of like bishops, bring the queen back one or two squares. I don't know, you, you've probably seen this as well. Like this is just guys trying to avoid main line. And so they're going for these positions. Yeah, and it all starts with Magnus, right? Magnus has done some Queen D2, B3 stuff against Wojtacek mm -hmm. and all this stuff. But I like your point about Grishuk playing for more. When you make seem like Knight H5, like, what is he doing? Why is his Knight over there on the rim? It's not attacking anything. The square F4 is well covered by White. So this Knight has no real future prospect, but he's avoiding trades for the time being. That allows him to play moves like H6, moves like E6, kicking some of White's pieces back and then deciding how to continue. That said, after the move C3 is played, I mean, it does seem... Pretty straightforward for white, a rook to d1, maybe a rook to e1, and white has no targets for black to exploit either. Yeah, and this c3 move is nice, obviously just you know, blunting the dark squared bishop. Uh, I went for a quick foray 
uh, looking at the other games, but everything looks fairly balanced. Um, yeah, I mean, the question is like, what does Black do now, right? It's kind of like what you just said. Okay, you played Knight H5. Do you continue with moves like Rook to the, you know, Rook to C8, D8, E8, or is it time to play things like H6, E6, F6, <laughs> F6, F5? Like, I don't know. Um, so, it's a, it's a, okay, so he goes for H6, much more natural than F6, obviously. Yeah, and now Bishop H4 makes sense because you can't bring your knight back to F6. So just to show why, is once I take on F6 and we get these trades, you're left with this ugly pawn structure. In some lines, it's not the end of the world, but you don't want an isolated pawn on D6 and these double F pawns. So if you were going to try to bring your knight back at some point, a move like G5 might be required, but then you're exposing your king side, not in a way that you're going to get attacked, but you're leaving behind some vulnerable squares. For instance, if you go G5, now you have to look is at some moment this knight coming into F5. So just things to keep in the back of your mind. Of course, once pawns move, they can't retreat. Yeah, it's a very, very good point here. Um, I feel like a lot of this middle game is going to be determined by, by these five pawns for black. You know, do you put one on G5? Big question, like you just said. Do you, do you play for F5? Do you play for E6? And then maybe pushing D5 in the future. Um, well, I, I, at this point, I leave it in Grishuk's capable hands. Uh, I, I can only offer suggestions. Like, if you do play G5, you know, um, what's your follow-up? Because you know the bishop's coming back to G3. Uh, so oh, <laughs> I, there's some positions where this doesn't work, you know, and there's a sacrifice on G5 coming, but something tells me that's that's not going to happen. Uh, so Shimonov is up nearly three minutes on time. That's obviously a byproduct, number one, of the fact that Alexander Grishuk just gets into time trouble. But uh, this he must be super familiar with this stuff. I mean, he must have played this in the past. Yeah, he has. According to Wesley, so in the chat, Shimano's played this line many times. And so that's why he's so comfortable and he's moving so quickly. Right, yeah. Well, well let's uh, move to another game because I saw one in the corner of my eye that looked a bit odd, this Nizhnik game against Faruja. Yeah. Because at first I thought that Black was Castle Queenside because otherwise why would White have this king on G2 and no light square bishop to work with? But maybe just Nizhnik being kind of a boss is, I mean, I don't like the light squares around the white king. This pawn on c5 is weaker than it is strong. And like, what does white really have to show for some of the vulnerabilities in his position? Yeah, I've this whole game has been, uh, well, I guess even, even from the very, very beginning, like move seven, right? This is kind of like the professional solution to the symmetrical Grunfeld. Like when, when white goes for the, you know, the Fianchetto setup with g3, bishop g2, it's like you play c6, you get these symmetrical structures, white play, you know, 95, 94 kind of a thing. But Nizhnik not interested, and he trades quickly and then plays c5, and then that's our first siren of the day, I think. Yep, that's um, on my end. My bad. <laughs> I was like, is that me? That's the <laughs> problem with two two commentators from New York. Yep. Um, I think Nizhnik has shown a really kind of nice style of, like, retreating, advancing, retreating, advancing, you know, moving pieces to to like their, their optimal squares. And uh, whereas the game of, you know, Shimon of Grishuk was determined by the structure of the pawns, this game is really going to be determined by whether the C5 pawn is an asset or a liability uh, for white. And right. at the moment, I don't know. A move ago, it looked like it could be a liability. Now, I don't know. Maybe an asset? Kind of nice. Blocking space, blocking the rook. Rook D3. Okay. I like that move because you're just trying to pile up your rooks in the D file. And if white were to take on D3, then the queen comes in. You can't easily kick the queen out unless you're trying to offer an exchange of queens in which case then black has nothing to worry about um I, I actually liked your assessment just a second ago before rook d3 was like it's starting to look like the c5 pawn is safe and sound and it's actually going to be more of a nuisance but rook d3 was a clever solution as white did not want to seed control the d file so he traded rooks and now he's offering an exchange of queens but once the queens come off the board how in the world can white be anything but slightly worse with this pawn on c5 and black will also be the first one to the d file yeah, and he, here's the question. Um, you could take the queen. You can defend it with rook d8, which I'll, yeah, so he, that's a very natural looking move just to play rook d8. Yep. Um, but if queen takes, rook takes, and you just bring the king to e2, right? Like that's probably the most, you know, evacuation method that exists here. Um, retreating, although it could have been a better move, like just going back to a6 or b5, maintaining pressure on c5 or a2, it's so difficult to play psychologically, right? Because it's like, you feel like you're, you're not making any progress. You're, you're giving away the file for a moment. Well, not quite because you have rook d8, but like, you know, you just, it doesn't feel quite right. But 
it could have very well been the right decision, but okay, this is obviously a very low risk position. So he just goes for the trades and, um, yeah, I think from a, a team strategy, Nizhnik's doing the right approach. He's just like, why should I risk anything? Not that there was really much at stake there, but he's like, I'm slightly better in an end game where it'd be very, very hard for me to lose. So why don't I just try to outplay Ali Reza for in an end game? And, and one thing to note about Ali Reza, he's a superstar. He's incredibly talented. But in Vikingze, where I was commentating, I saw him kind of botch certain positions that were more strategic. And I'm not saying he will uh, blunder this one, but you know, it's something said with Nizhnik, even though he's lower rated, he does have great experience. He went three and a half out of four against St. Louis, if I'm not mistaken. So he's going to try to outplay his a younger but higher rated opponent in a position where it really feels like Black has no losing chances whatsoever. Yeah, I definitely feel like, of you know, and by the way, we have our first draw. So we have uh, Hanson and uh, uh, Ray Robson. It's an obviously solid result. I mean, you can't ask for I don't know if you can ask for, for more or not. I think the game was a Berlin. It was a pretty tame variation and it's, you know, it's round one. So no one taking too much risk. Yep. Um, at least the colors were right this time, but yeah, I mean, you know, in, uh, in this game in particular, uh, Bishop H six seems to be the way for black to, to try to stir up trouble. Um, but I, I, I don't see anything beyond that. I mean, what, what, is, what is, what else can black play? Can black play for F five? Okay, he plays bishop h6, but I was going to f5 with the idea of king e2, just pawn takes e4. That would have been the idea. Right. Um, so if you let me, I'm t protecting my rook on d3, and if you take back, then you lose g3. So f5 had some punch to it. I guess there was just been an exchange on f5 and then king e2. Um, but at least here, the e3 square is under black's control. So if you tried to attack my rook on d3, I'll get you with rook e3 check. And, well, here comes f5. This does seem promising for for uh for black but promising and an objective evaluation are very different things that's that's where us humans are worse than engines you know we say words to evaluate positions and computers are like it's completely fine you know i i have this move and this move i, I don't know i mean probably you have to take on f5 right what else can you play um yeah because if you don't then this rook on d3 is looking much more powerful along the third rank so taking on f5 is not the thing you want to do per se but it might be the thing that you have to do i guess bishop d2 also comes to mind is just trying to swap off bishops yeah the biggest thing on bishop d2 probably you have to evaluate if the knight end game is good or you know well i don't know if it's good but holdable um yeah you have a good point here because actually there's some knight b4 stuff as well coming to d3 with check or winning the a2 pawn yeah 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 and i mean at, at the same time you're always asking how much do i have to trade in these positions and probably in this case trading the rook would make sense i mean the only way to keep it on is to play like knight b4 immediately or to play rook c3 but rook c3 is silly i think it's not even attacking anything so um the big question is like king e2 now looks ridiculous right because you just run into rook e3 check which is the whole point right so so he goes for f4 he just blocks the bishop out but i feel like this is making the rook on d3 just far more justified in its positioning right i mean does he want knight c1? Is that his idea? Knight C it might be his idea, knight c1 next. But the rook out. It's probably not something he wants as much as something he feels like he has to play. But yeah, rook d5 hits the c5 pawn. I mean, white's just kind of going back and forth, hoping that black can't make progress. And this is a great position for Nizhnik to keep pushing. Bishop f8 at the right moment will hit this pawn on c5 as the bishop has sort of overstayed its welcome on the h6 square. The f4 pawn makes it look a bit silly. But back on f8, now it's attacking c5 and continues to put pressure in white's position. And I love black's chances here. I know that it's probably not that, objectively, not that great for black, but I just think it's so much easier to play for Nizhnik. It definitely is. Uh, my question when f4 came on the board was, I mean, obviously knight c1's the idea to kick the rook out on the next move. The only way to avoid that would have been to play bishop g7. I think because if you after f4 play bishop g7 and there's a trade your rook has access to a3 right that's literally the only way you can't do anything else i mean you can play some crazy move like e5 but that doesn't that's just the sacrifice doesn't do anything so i was thinking like maybe this this is the way you avoid getting hit with knight c1 i mean knight c1 knight b3 was already a draw offer basically by Ferugia, right uh, because he's already you know he he's he's probably not not thrilled about this now we're seeing that the c5 pawn could very well be a liability um for uh, yeah, just Bishop F8 is coming. I mean, it's it's Nizhnik's game to win, if anybody's. Absolutely. So we'll uh, 
keep an eye on this one. We'll see if uh, Ferruja, and I was going to say E5 is possible because there's a problem on D2. And that's why it's not just losing a pawn. If F E5, I can take on D2 and get a knight versus a bishop. And the reason why we like that is, yes, the bishop has a longer scope, but the knight can go from color complex to color complex, use the light squares to its advantage. And the connected pawns on the queen side versus the separated pawns on the queen side for white allows this king to just hop into a square like D5 and go after some of the vulnerabilities. Wow. Uh, if we can just quickly jump back to uh, just the, the Shima game, uh, Shaman of Grishuk. Uh, this, we, we left this game on move 13. It's move 17. It feels like it's been 20 moves, does it not? It's been four. Yep. And it feels like white has done nothing. And look at black's position. Well, white like, has stolen a pawn. Oh, I so, didn't even. I mean, that's how that's how un, un, unimpressive the position looked. You know, like I didn't even I didn't even see that. Okay, so Grishuk sacks a pawn. But you you have a good point though because uh, it looks so bad for White. And it, you know, if you didn't have a pawn for your troubles, you'd be like, what are you have you been doing? This bishop on h4 can get trapped right now with g5. But then you need to look at some of the sacrifices with bishop takes g5. And why is it trapped? If you go back to g3, I go f4. Not only am I forking your bishop on g3 and you're not on e3, but the bishop has nowhere to go. So even if that knight were not on e3, that bishop is in trouble. So if we go to the game g5, I think bishop g5, hg5, knight takes g5. White now has three pawns for the piece. And the king on g8 might be a bit exposed, but black still should be better even in a line like this. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to figure out the difference between, well, probably, you, yeah, you have to play queen f6 because queen e7, just queen g6. Right. And then, well, it's not mate, you have knight f6, but knight f5 and, okay, re resigns. Yeah. Um, so queen f6, and then the big question is, can, can you know, can black, can black win this position? I mean, I, I'm pretty confident. It looks very nice after queen f6, like queen d5 and then some king h8. I mean, you, you look completely safe. Um, but well, we'll see if Grishuk wants to go for it with g5. I yeah. don't really know what else you play, right? Like, what what, what else can you do? Can he take this pawn on a2? I know it looks ridiculous. <laughs> but... <laughs> man, <laughs> commentary with Yasser out here, man. This yeah. is, uh, yeah. You know, I don't... Yasser's rubbed off on me and his greediness. No, and queen, g6, queen g6, queen g6. Queen yeah, g6. I know, I know, I know. But I, no, I just, he does play g5. He has played g5. He, he had to play g5. He really didn't have much of a, a choice because you know it's not like black can just sit and wait forever. You are down a pawn and uh, your pieces aren't having the easiest time moving. And here's the queen of six line that we anticipated. But um, it's just it's just funny because Grisha could have made that move instantly, g5, but he spent a minute and a half doing so. And uh, I think Jeremy Silman just wrote an article for chess.com pretty much. Uh, the title was, Why Do Grandmasters Think So Much? <laughs> well, fair. Uh, <laughs> some developments. So Nijnuk has secured a completely winning position against Ali Reza. Okay, let's go to that uh, game really so quickly. Pretty instructional endgame. Anish Giri has put in the work with the black pieces from a... Uh, uh, just you know one of these e3 slavs the slow slav the quiet slav uh, which it, it's called that but actually gets very tactical and dynamic very fast ironically yep. uh, he's putting in the work we have people in the game chat saying is that the real anish giri people are saying yes people are saying it must be i'm amazed that people just think these are random games that are going on like <laughs> <laughs> these are games worth tens of thousands of dollars and you know international implication of uh Esport development. Is that the real Anish Giri? Um, <laughs> Please stand up. Yeah, seriously. Uh, wow. I mean, this is big stuff. Nizhnuk, big time. Uh, he's got to convert this, though. King and four versus king and four. And, um, and the reason why his position is so good as black is, well, this pawn c5 is always a target. But if this pawn gets to a3 and the king can go to b2, it's not just the c pawn, but also the b pawn that it is an issue here. And Farouj has been shuffling back and forth with king e3, king f3, and, you know, he wants his pawn on h6 as well. But I don't know. It, it feels like black is just way ahead because the king is ready to dart into the position. Well, yeah, Robert, it's calculation time. King e3, king d5, king f4, king c5, king g5, b5, king h6, b4, king h7, b3. You know, like, this is the part where you set this up for your student and then they have to work out whether this is winning or a draw. Um, a3 makes a lot of sense because... You know, it, it's the advancement of the pawn. And then here, everybody, the, the point is not that the black king is going to run in here and take the pawn. It's that the black king is going to take the C pawn. And yep. the B pawn is going to be the deflecting pawn. And then that pawn going to promote. So in, in king and pawn endgames, always looking at the king run, but also the pawn play. Uh, 
Uh, and Firuja can't do the same thing. He can't go like pawn h6, for example, you know. Um, the thing I'm always curious about, like Firuja had this end game in, in Wyke against Anish Giri. Remember, and he played like a4 and it was winning. Yep. And the question I always have is, when do they know it's a draw or a win? You know, like, the, has Ferruja known it's lost for a while? Or is he, like, just now realizing it's losing completely? Well, so, he's thinking pretty deeply here, as, like, we can see him on camera. He looks frustrated I, as well, so. Yeah, and Nizhik looks, he looks a little red, but <laughs> probably not, not, not an upset red. It's probably just the glare of the camera. And yeah. Anish Giri has won his game, by the way. Um, but here Ferruja went G4, trying to uh, get his king closer in. Because if his king can go steal this pawn, then... You know, then he has hopes that his H pawn will run, but unfortunately, when the A pawn queens, it's on the same diagonal as well as this H pawn. So, um, feels like this should be quick enough. So here it comes, B4. Yes. Yep. And the it's big just... thing is that the A pawn promotes before the H pawn, and at the same time, uh... don't take that pawn. Exactly. That was huge. That was really big. It's a very destructive moment. If you take this pawn to draw because you get a queen, then White goes here, and this is a theoretical draw. Yeah, but because of the existence of the B pawn, any stalemate position no longer works, right? That's the big thing. So normal under normal circumstances, without the existence of the pawn, this, this position is a draw because it is the H pawn. So because that pawn exists, there's no more stalemates, right? The king is just going to run in and mate. So for example, I mean, we could play this out. I'll be white. Yeah. You want me to play white? Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, just gonna, looking at our final game. <laughs> I'm just going to show exactly why that is. You get a queen. Good for you. Checkmate in one. So it actually reminds me, uh, and we'll go to the final game. We can always come back to that one. But that was a really instructive end game as we go to the Sh Shimano Grishuk game. That reminds me of Wesley So's win against Fedoseyev in the Fisher Random Championship, where it was a similar position, but Fedoseyev uh, put his king in the wrong place, and Wesley mm. was able to bring his king in and win that end game. So here we have a two knights, a rook, and six pawns against two knights, bishop, rook, and three pawns. So it's three pawns for a piece. And honestly, I, you know, I don't mind white's position in right now because I think the extra pawns should be sufficient for um, counterplay and probably not even uh, a worse position at this point. Plus the time advantage, a minute extra for Shimano here. Yeah, but is that really where you want Grishchuk? I almost feel like you need him to be up on time to take away his powers. Um, this is a... Uh, this has really, really been a fight. This is this is great stuff from from Shimanov and Grishuk. Uh, I I have not a clue how to evaluate positions like this because on the one hand, the extra piece should be very, very useful. I mean, you should really feel the presence of, of it. But Black has no way to attack anything in White's position. If he had a light squared bishop instead of a knight, like if his knight on g7 didn't exist, he had a light squared bishop. I mean, technically, if you put a light squared bishop anywhere. On, on this on this board for for black that's not under attack black should just be much much better it feels like and they just drew wow <laughs> there you go that they didn't know who was better either robert <laughs> so they drew they repeated um, these moves here with yeah. rook e6 rook h6 rook e6 rook h6 and i mean i guess it goes to show that white wanted to be very active here and the black had wanted to go knight of six but the problem with the move like knight of six is i go knight takes e7 check and you cannot take with a rook without losing your knight on f6. And if you take with a knight, then I have moves like knight e or g5. I'm not sure even which one is better. But I'm attacking your rook. And f7 is the only square that protects both e7 and f6 knights. So you're losing in exchange. The white already has three extra pawns. So this would be very bad news uh, for black. So that's why Grishuk went back to g7 instead of um, trying to go knight to f6. And they just agreed on the draw as there are no hanging pieces in black's position. Well, this was a this was a very very exciting first round, with the exception of of Eric Hansen versus Spicy Caterpillar, which was a, I, I yeah, it was just regular regular old Berlin draw. Um, but yeah, take the two bishops in theoretical waters, and then Robson had no difficulty just making a draw. Yeah, well, that shows the match strategy. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna take a short break, and we will uh, we'll be back. This match is is heating up already.
Welcome back, everybody. Round one was exciting. It was two to two. You can't ask for much more unless you're a New York fan and we blow 3-1 leads in every match. But we are going to focus on the prizes uh, for the Pro Chess League, Robert. Um, if I had a dollar for every time I heard you complain about the New York Marshals, maybe I would have that $20,000 first place prize. Well, you you won't because you're not a member of one of these uh, one of these teams. So, so how about that, Robert? Um, listen, good cash money in the future... The uncapped rating system, in my mind, will get this prize fund to 100, 200, 400. I mean, we already have lineup bonuses for fielding strong teams, right? So this is, this is wonderful. Uh, I don't know if we'll ever quite get to an $8 million first place prize like in the World Series of Poker. Um, but I wouldn't complain. <laughs> I also wouldn't complain. I would maybe even play for a team if that were the case. I will. People have been asking. They, they always ask me, why are you not on a team? I'm like, you want me to make a team worse? That's not, <laughs> that's not, that's not very kind. I think we had a couple more uh, logistical things about the league we wanted to run everybody through, and then we, uh, we were, or were just ready for the games to get underway. Um, but there's, uh, you know, we've got, got all of our social media. Uh, if you guys want merch, uh, Chesbra, as usual, leading the way. You know, they've got, the, the reason why Eric Hansen is, is called you know, Mr. Chesbro himself. I mean, it's it's quite literally that he's like incorporated a, a business around this, right? Like, so this is this is this is amazing. They've got great merch. Uh, hopefully, all teams will have jerseys in the future. But we've got games underway. We do. Uh, where are we where are we going? Where are we we want to look at Hanson Nijnik. What are we? Nijnik? We gave Anish Giri no love last okay. round, even though he scored the lone victory for the Chesbro. So at some point, we'll give him love. It's too early. No moves been played on his board. I'm, I'm keeping it. Uh, and the court of my eye. So let's start with Grishuk against Corey because Corey was the person who lost for the Chicago win, but he's very, very talented, uh, even if you know he had a tough first go of things. Anish Giri does not know that his game has started, by the way. Um, so maybe, he just hasn't moved. It's been a minute. <laughs> should I go hit him up? Like, should I be like, Anish? Oh, I, oh he moved. moved. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it's almost like he, he did it on purpose. He just said, I won my first game, so let me take 40 seconds for no reason just to uh, give you a chance. But I do think Anish Giri, he's well-prepared. He's ready for the candidates. Uh, he will continue to make his mark on this match. Let's, uh, well, we did give Grishuk love. We did give Corey love. What, what, are, we, what are we settling on for, for this match, for, for right now? I mean, Nishnuk versus Hansen is definitely going to be exciting okay. because... Yeah, this this is this kind of like main line c4 with the four knights i assume knight f6 knight f3 is about to be played but that's actually the, the transposition back to the main line so eric hansen played bishop before on move two because he he, he wanted he wanted uh Nizhnik to play knight d5 that's kind of right. like the, the the way you 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 take advantage of this move order but Queen c2 followed by, you know, e3. And see, this is exactly what he's doing. He's not playing knight f6. He's taking immediately to avoid that main line. And now we're going to get this bc3 and d4. Maybe d3, e4 is another way to play this position. Uh, we'll see what we'll see what Nizhnik does here with his pawns. Uh, yeah, this d3, e4 line is, uh, can be quite annoying because white just has more control of the center. Look at the d4 squares under white's control. You have a firm uh, class with the d5 square as well. So uh, I think for now... Eric is a little out of his element. He spent more time in the opening, but he, of course, can catch up. I, I want to go take us at some point, maybe now, to the Ferruja game against Ray Robson because okay. I, I think this game will be interesting for sure now that it has to split F5. But the game between Spicy Caterpillar and Ferruja, look at this move, G4 by Robson. And you know, Ray is like Grisho. If he is not down on the clock, that means he's probably in some trouble. So <laughs> he's always spending time very early and often. And, you know, he's kind of a disciple of Grishuk's in that regard. But G4 makes his intentions very clear. I want to get after you on the king side. You know, I've, uh, I've had to, wow, Bishop F8. Um, I've had to investigate this line recently because I was working with a anonymous, talented U.S. junior player uh, who, needed, who needed me to do a little bit of opening research on this line, this Bishop C5 uh, variation in, in the, in, in the Rui this kind of anti-Berlin system, you know, uh, where black tries to play knight f6 and white plays d3 and says no Berlin for you. Uh, white's been trying so much stuff. And actually, if you look at this variation, Wesley and Hikaru played this a hundred times in their most recent head-to-head. -head. Like right. Hikaru was winning with black and, uh, you know, Wesley was winning with white. 
lot of theory here, a lot of theory, and all of it is very, very new. But this position in particular doesn't strike me as familiar. <laughs> I don't remember seeing G4. So yeah, it's, it's a bit odd, right? Because when you're playing G4, H4, you're going for an attack. But you're, normally it helps when your opponent has minor pieces over there. And, there, and that sounds counterintuitive. Wouldn't minor pieces help your opponent in the defense? But it also helps pawns push forward with a tempo. So if there were a knight on f6, you'd play g5, and the knight would have to move away from f6. But now, black is not really in any immediate danger once these pawns start pushing. And actually, uh, g4 was a novelty. Uh, I, I did a little bit of, of, of uh, research uh, while, you were, while you were talking, and um, Karyakin plays this line a lot with black. Uh, he's, he's played it several times, played it against Dominguez, played it against Vitugov. Yakovenko has played this with Black. Um, it, and, and basically, it's, it's, it's a lot, lot of theory. Uh, Queen E2 is already very early on getting out of, the, out of the theoretical elements. Usually White is just castling. But Queen E2, Rook E8, Bishop D2. And then it, it obviously looks like White is about to castle Queenside, but then Black starts launching the pawns and uh, White puts that on hold. And he plays, uh, he plays G4 instead. You know what's interesting, Robert? Firuja so. himself had this position in 2017 with White. And he played A4 on move 11. And that was against uh, Falco Bindrik in the Aeroflot Open. He had this. Uh, and he won by playing A4. So I wonder if Ray knows that. I'm sure Ali Reza knows that. <laughs> uh, but wow. Uh, I always love seeing things like that. You know, like a player has this with black and with white several years apart. Obviously, yeah. both of these guys super well prepared. It's one of those things where you, you know, if you haven't prepped specifically for this game, you don't want to walk into your opponent's preparation. So you deviate, uh, you know, you're still in somewhat familiar territory, but you don't want to follow the main lines that uh, someone that has computer-backed analysis in. And I mean, Levy, I think what you said is a very good point that Black is just trying to get a counterattack on the queen side, A4, B3. And that actually seems much quicker than whatever white is trying to do over there on the king side. And he plays H5, but what next? H6, I can just push my pawn to G6. And here comes A4, B3. And the D3 pawn is the real weakness. Bishop takes B4, looks like a free pawn, but knight takes D3 is a check. And once you take back, I take on B4 with the check. And now I have two bishops. Bishop will come to A6 to hit against the D3 pawn as well. It feels like, again, black is the one who has more promise in this position. So I, I, I'm digging Farouge's chances here. Yeah, and I mean, obviously you can't take that pawn because of knight d3. So I feel like uh, this is one of these games Ray is going to spend a lot of time, a lot of time trying to figure out everything. And th this feels like Ali Reza's game to, to win because I've seen Ray do this in the past. Ray is a super, super, super strong player. But if he gets to a situation where he's got a minute versus six or a minute versus seven, and the position's still super complicated, that's Ali Reza's wheelhouse. Yep. So, you know, for example, here, F6, Bishop E3, um, you know, Ali Reza will continue to instigate on the queen side. But you can't go B3 yet because after A, B3, you unfortunately can't take yeah. back with the pawn as the rook is hanging. So you can throw a bishop takes F5. I mean, maybe you can play B3. You just go bishop F5, and after you take back on F5, then you take on B3 and... Once again, you're going for this D3 situation, but you've opened the G file. Uh, perhaps white can be okay, but I, I agree with you that it doesn't really look optimal as the white king doesn't have anywhere totally safe to go either. So F6, bishop E3 has indeed been played, and maybe knight E6. Yeah, that's, yeah, I was going to say, that's usually the move in, in a lot of these structures. Uh, wow, uh, G G Shimon of Giri, draw. Okay, uh, I'm just going to show that real quick. It seems like they <laughs> look at the game chat. <laughs> solid <laughs> I mean, what a weird looking draw to make with the bishop repeating between g5 g3 and f4 h4 but yeah i guess for black you know if you ever went g5 pushing pawns in front of your king makes your king side more vulnerable it also looks aggressive but i guess it wasn't panning out for him and geary i guess that's a disappointing result right you had the white pieces against the board four for chicago yeah, I guess Geary, I don't know what this is. I mean, just uh, unhappily handled this opening. I mean, it's all theory, right? Like, and then what What went wrong, you know? Like, why Why was it such a quick draw? Too uh, locked. Wow. Some GM banter. So Anish Geary says solid. Alex Shimanov says you never lose anyways. 
and then says G GL in the candidates. <laughs> and then Wesley So says Anish does not want to go for an O to make the match more interesting. <laughs> He's he nerfing did, himself. He did that last week, right? So uh, Anish, of course, uh, playing the candidates coming up. Also a, a great teammate for these chess bras. They're very happy to have him. Uh, but not the result the chess bras were looking for because Chicago continues to hang in tough. And I mean, we can go to any game. I still have the Ray Robson Ferruja game on, but I'm happy to switch gears and go to back to the Hanson Nizhnik game as a lot has changed there. Yeah. Uh, wow. This is a, there's a lot of banter going on. Wow. Wesley, <laughs> Wesley said, be careful shaking hands with Wang. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not getting involved in those conversations. So it's just, <laughs> yeah, let's, let's move it over. <laughs> yeah, not not a big fan of that joking about something as serious as coronavirus. So, um, yeah, here we have this game between Nizhnik and Hansen. Hansen kind of looks like he's praying. You know, we have him on camera now. And <laughs> okay, I'm starting to like Hansen's position because of this knight on c4. That's a great piece. It's locked in there on a light square. The only way to kick it out is if somehow you can make your knight from f4 go to a square like b2. That's not happening. The bishop can come back to f1, but you don't want to give up your fianchetto light square bishop for that knight on c4 either. So I like the kind of the, the clamp that Hansen has in this position. So this is this is um, an opening disaster for Nijnuk, and it's 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 a beautiful success story for Hansen because Hansen. Of, you know, evaded theory, and then by evading theory with this early capture on c3, um, he got Nizhnuk in, I guess, one of the places where Nizhnuk is not that familiar. N Nizhnuk is kind of known as like an opening beast. Yeah. Uh, he's got very, you know, very good preparation. But here, he just gave Eric the greatest pawn chain in the history of pawn chains. <laughs> like, wow, and look at this. Oh, this is this is a big statement game from from Mr. Hansen. I mean, when when Hansen wins like this, uh, the chess world is winning. Maybe Chicago win; they're not winning. But this is this is a nice, you know, confident Hansen. Uh, he's got a time advantage, positional advantage. He's, he's crushing here. Great stuff from him. Yeah, just winning at this point, right? His queen is about to get down to h two square. Here comes the ambulance. That seems to be for Nizhnik's position. And well, Bishop takes g four, just straightforward. I'm not gonna lie; that sounded like a that. Yeah, it I think sounds it's like a fire, a fire truck. truck. Yeah, it we is. know. You know, we know. It yeah. is. But, you know, it just had to work with what's happening in this game. And, and look at this bishop g4. Your knight's under attack. Your pawn h3 is under attack. Knight g3 doesn't help matters. It's queen h4, which uh, attacks this knight on g3. So, how yeah. can Nizhnik, okay, when knight g3, I'm sure anything, how he can keep this even complicated? It feels. Very knight h1, Robert. Got to play knight h1. Oh, you, you could keep this complicated by playing something like. Uh, uh, so Robert, um, <laughs> maybe we look at another game. I don't know. <laughs> this, uh, yeah, this, this, is... this looks, this kind of looks hopeless, but it's the pro chess league. Anything can happen. And a big reason why is look at this Bishop on C1. That is one of the worst pieces you can ask for because I mean, it just can't move. If you go to D2, there'd be knight A3. If it moved anywhere else the E3 pawn is hanging. So it's like, even though it, has access off of the first rank it just loses material so it just makes matters worse H hansen is winning look at him he's bopping his head there probably got some techno music on and hansen with a big performance right now for the chess bros yeah i i i wonder what he's listening it's, it's got it's got to be hard bass <laughs> it's got it's got to be some you know techno hard techno beat i've been uh, Ilya on the other side, munching on the shirt. Uh, very strange game from him. I guess just not a lot of familiarity with the position, but uh, Hansen just just brilliant here. This is this is great stuff. Uh, yeah. yeah, Ilya never got going in this game. It's so weird. Like Ilya played brilliantly last game, and then like this. It's just strange how that happens. I now never understand that, but that's chess. It's the beauty of it. It's not over though. Hansen's got to continue to push, and he's got to push the right way. Like. You take your foot out of the gas for a moment. From for, for example, you might play like I don't know. I was I, I was I was going to suggest like a bad move, and I can't even think of a bad move. You know, Queen well, F four. Queen F four is a bad move, but that's. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess you know, you do have a point because if White can make let's say Queen F two and trade queens, there are some chances that White holds in an end game down a pawn. So Knight H five is a very nice move, not allowing uh, White to just kind of liquid, you know, liquidate and uh, try to approach 
more of an end game type position. Yeah, the V7 pawn might be a target, but the F file is way more important. And there are just tons of different mating patterns that Black can take advantage of here. It just, yeah, this is a really bad position. I mean, rook takes F8, rook takes F8, queen E2 out of desperation, covering E1, covering F2. But you're inviting the knight into G3, for instance. I would even consider knight F4, and I wouldn't play it. But I, I think about it because it's not my game. But everything just looks... Plus, rook f7, being calm, protecting your b7 pawn. The bishop on c1 continues to be stuck in place. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the biggest example of how bad the position is can be shown in the variation knight g3, queen g4. And then if you trade the queens, knight e2, something like king h1, rook f2. And then if rook takes b7, I mean, you just can't play it, right? Like, <laughs> I'm just like... There's the B7 pawns not even hanging is basically what I was trying to say. Like, I mean, look at this position. <laughs> this is so bad. <laughs> yeah, it's... this this is as pretty much as unfortunate as I guess. I like that move G4, G4 opening up good, yeah. another file because if the queen comes and takes back on G4, in comes the rook to help with the attack. Uh, rook F6 to H6, you might want to play once the H file is open. This is just, this is it. So this is going to be a win for Hansen. And let us go back to our game between... Ferruja and Robson, because Levy, you're going to be happy to see this one. What is going on here? Uh, are you saying I'm going to be happy to see this because it's chaos? Yes, and you're an agent of chaos, just I, like the Joker. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we're going a little off script. I'm not. Uh, <laughs> I'm not sure what. A, I love this position. Uh, th this seems like it's it's the kind of game that is is in the balance by a move. You know, like one move either way is either winning or losing, or it's just it's just zero zero zero. There's like that one computer line, which is just equality. So obviously the first move you're considering is knight takes d3 check, because always look for checks. You've got to start calculating what, you know, knight d3, can you sacrifice the exchange or is it probably just king b1? And it doesn't seem like black has anything. Like right. you just, you, you've got nothing here. There's no discovered attack that that works. So then you start looking at bishop d3 because losing a queen would be bad. Um, and now the question is, do you play something like, no, you have to sacrifice because if queen e3, rook c4. Yep. So, so he does all, sacrifice. Yep. All of this happening. You're, you're, you're actually, your assessment of the position is great because you know, knight d3 comes with a check. So that is the first thing that comes to mind. But then you realize the king escapes. So now he's trying to go rook c4 checkmate. So that's why you had to sacrifice on d3 to begin with. And now in this position, you have a draw. Knight h6 check, the pawn yep. is pinned. Then knight f7 check, and the king has to go back and forth because the g7 pawn can't capture as it is pinned. So white has at least a draw here. And so now you think, okay, I can think for the rest of my time. I have a minute and a half left. Can I find something better? Do I have some sort of capture on G7 coming? Can I just trade queens and say queen D3, knight D3, king D2, and try to go for this G7 pawn after? You will still have knight H6 check, knight F7 draw. So you can play on for at least a couple more moves in this scenario, but you might ultimately have to make the draw. So, you know, is it worth risking it? Yeah, you've always got the draw, but there there is a moment where if you play with the fire too much, you can get burned, um, as a great philosopher once said. You do have some really funny checkmating ideas, like knight takes e5, knight h6, knight ef7. Uh, but uh, <laughs> that's... Uh, a boy can dream. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen. Uh, black can also mate you with rook c4. So... Both sides can lose. I mean, it, it's most likely going to be. Ray's going to think down to two seconds, probably just repeat. Um, yes. And I think that that will be the case. Or you can, like I said, trade queens first and then go for this knight h6 check after because the threat is on g7. He starts with knight h6 check, which means he's certainly going to just accept the draw now because after king h8, there still is no threat. G takes f6 will not be possible because rook g8 would be checkmate. But it does feel like a position where if you let the position stay a little too long, it will just be good for black who's up material, especially with rook c4 checkmate on the docket. And Eric Hansen has officially won his game against Ilya Nizhnik, by the way. That's that's a huge win. I think of all the games in the round, that game they needed they needed Nizhnik to, to, to get a win. That would have been huge, by the way, if Nizhnik won that game, because that would have been two wins with black, yep. which... I mean that could have that could have swung the match, you know. Like I, it's obviously too early to make predictions, but two wins with black, you got two games with white. I mean, take no risk, make some draws, or play for the win. Obviously, depending on the match situation, make them take the risk. But uh, Grishuk now the final game remaining, just slightly better here against uh, Corey. Probably going to pick up a pawn on b6, or he has rook c7. 
and this is already the match unwinding. It, it, it always takes a second. It, it always takes like a, just a second and the whole match is all of a sudden out of reach. So, but we've seen two point deficits overcome, <laughs> particularly by opponents of the New York Marshals. Um, yeah. Again, another dollar in my bank account. Thank you, Levy. Uh, but this position is one where Grishuk is also up two minutes in the clock, not something you see every day. And the B6 pawn is weak. And the C file is completely under White's control because the bishop on H3 just kicked the rook away a couple moves ago. Uh, but if you do take on B6, you have to watch out for the opening of this long diagonal. So that is the one thing that Grishuk is really considering here as uh, if you take on B, okay, it was rook c7 first, but there are some lines where you sacrifice with d4. Here he goes into an end game that is just very favorable for white. And why is it favorable? The bishop on b7, not the best piece. That's why I moved to d5, but you have full control over the c file, thanks to your bishop on h3, preventing a rook from coming to c8. The knight on d4 is on a nice outpost protected by a pawn. Um, the b and a pawns for black are in much more danger than whites are. You can fix the pawn structure on the queen side for white. And you're up two minutes to boot. So did I say enough good things for White here, Levy? I think so. Uh, I think you've basically fully summarized it. Uh, I'm a little bit disappointed, you know, because Corey is this is this guy who all, all these like mid 26, 50, 26, 60 guys, you you really do cheer for them to, to hit 2,700. Uh, just a, you know, just a bummer. But uh, he's had, obviously some tough opposition to start. He, he's the one guy that's had to play both super GMs. Uh, I don't think... Oh, well, so did Shimanov. I guess they, they went back and forth. They traded opponents. But you know, Shima, Shima held his own, you know? And um, this one is is quickly unraveling. Yeah, Grishuk just playing Rook C5. And uh, has Grishuk... Grishuk lost one game all season? That sounds right. Also, three, two, one. Corey, you gotta move. What? Uh, okay. Uh... What was that? that I don't was, know. Man, that was in, strange. In Gotham, that gets you on the nerd board, you know, running your time out in a losing position. <laughs> but, but uh, but this isn't like a completely lost position. It's a very bad position. I mean, you and I acknowledge that. It's very uh, simple to see that you know, the Rook can't come to CA. White has all this control over uh, files and ranks. But losing on time here, that feels inexcusable, honestly. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. He could have, he could have been frustrated. Could have been, could have been anything. But uh, wow, that's a big, big round. I mean, the biggest game of the round, obviously. Uh, Nijnik Hansen, huge credit to uh, to Eric. What a, what a game he put on. And uh, Canada takes the, the first lead of the match, whether expected or unexpected. But now Chicago's going to have to fight back in rounds three and four. We'll take a short break, and we'll be right back.
premium membership at chess.com will help you improve your game with full access to a powerful set of learning tools. Unlimited tactics let you practice like a master with more than 50,000 puzzles to challenge you at every level. Our library of interactive chess lessons created by master coaches will enhance every aspect of your game. And after each game you play, the computer analysis feature will give you feedback on every move you played, turning every game into a chance to learn. And that's not all. Premium benefits also include unlimited tournaments, video lessons, the opening explorer, and much, much more. Upgrade now to take your game to the next level. And we are Welcome. back. Ooh. Oh. We're just you, stepping on each other. Uh, am I doing it or are you doing we, it? Who's do doing we, it? Do we have to settle this with a chess boxing match? Because uh, <laughs> feel, it feels right considering our daily question of if the candidates were to be decided by chess boxing, who would win and why? We have some answers here. You can read the first answer because I feel like you appreciate this one. All right. All right. Listen, Robert, my logic was you're the chess brains. You know, you provide the good commentary. I just got to say the words in the middle. You can't, can't do both. Otherwise, I'm just looking pretty. Anyway, <laughs> so at Zardo's 069. MVL would win because he's an athlete and he eats 200 grams of beans every evening. Now, we don't actually have factual evidence of this, but this is a theory of some sort. So we also have a uh, third the word saying Grishuk because I don't know. He's got a big height advantage. You got to say IDK, man. It's, no, gotta, I got okay. I got to go for the whole thing. All right. Well, let's let's read another answer from uh, Rajput Pratique 7. Fabi, I guess. Why is everyone unsure? Be confident. <laughs> We'll defend resourcefully until the opponent is tired and then use the conserve energy in later rounds, like at Floyd Money Mayweather. You know what would have been a good question? Oh, man, this would have been a better question. Can we make this question in between rounds? Let's go. We're, we're ready for our games. Robert, what would be the nicknames of the Super GMs and the candidates? Like, you know, Floyd Money Mayweather? Yep. Like, what would be their nicknames? I feel like, I feel like Grishuk would be... You know, because like in, in MMA, there's Thug Rose Nama Yunus. I feel yeah. like he'd be like Thug Grishuk. Sasha, Thug Life Grishuk. Oh my God, that would be, oh, this is a great question. I mean, then we got <laughs> to get Adiban in the mix because he's the beast, right? Yeah, he's so the beast, I feel, right? Also, I, I thought we'd do pretty well in chess boxing. He's a super nice dude though, so I feel like he wouldn't want to. And I, I probably wouldn't even appreciate us you know, talking about him boxing. But, you know, he's an athletic, sizable guy who's also extremely good at chess. So throw him in there. You know, he's the beast. He is the beast. You know who else is a beast? Is uh, Anish Giri with his uh, super, super solid results so far after the second round. <laughs> but uh, this round, we're going to – it's got a fun game coming up. It's going to be Giri versus uh, Nizhnyuk, I should say. Nizhnyuk versus uh, Giri. Um, I think Nizhnyuk is playing with the white. I might be, I might be wrong, uh, but we won't be wrong. I might be wrong. I thought, I thought Nizhnyuk was going to be white in this game, but – uh, that's that's going to be a, very fun, and hopefully Grishuk, uh, excuse me, hopefully Giri doesn't sit as far back as he is now, because I'm not sure he's going to reach his screen. Uh, he's just chilling. We're very up close and personal um, with uh, with the matches. Wait, I mean, is is Nishuk playing? Is Nishuk playing Grishuk this round? Is that what's going on? Yeah. Oh, because Ray Robson's the board one for the uh, wind. Oh, okay. Well, then, you know, he'll just be on cam. It, it's all good. <laughs> and uh, now Nizhnyuk doesn't know it's his move. You know, that's that works, I guess. We are getting a Sicilian, though, from, from Giri. So uh, clearly ready for a fight in this game. And actually, this is already an instructive-looking position where he's put h5, which makes it harder for Black to castle kingside as you push your pawn up the board. But the h5 pawn does stop the G pawn for pushing to G4. So look at the H pawn. It will gobble as soon as it uh, gets there. And yeah, we have um, now the E pawn on D5, which means the bishop came to F5. So two bishops each side, only one knight. And white's plan typically is by C4 to try to push through a C5 break. Yes, mm -hmm. it is. I, I love watching the Nidorf just the same way I love watching mixed martial arts. We've been talking about, you know, chess boxing. I, I would not do it. I would never, ever partake with white or with black. Have you ever played the Nidorf? Were you like a super booked up kid? 
No, I certainly was not a super booked up kid. I, um, you know, not the biggest fan of opening theory. I, I know a thing or two, but um, yeah, not a theoretician by no means. Yeah, so I, my expertise runs out after White plays something like C4. Uh, these early H5s uh, in, in, in the Nidorf are also fascinating to avoid G4, and they make a lot of sense. Complex it, theory likes it, like seems to do well with it. Just fascinating. You can play H5 and then you can castle short. You know, if my scholastic seven year old student did this, I'd be like, little Robbie, what the hell's wrong with you? But meanwhile, mainline theory at 2700 level says, yeah, of course, play H5. Why, why would you not play H5? Like that idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're, you're stopping, you know, White's progress, right? So why not? H4 is also an idea that Black can play. You have a Bishop on E7 protecting that square, and you can keep pushing that h pawn. It's the little engine that could. And for Ray Robson, he's gone knight a5, and after queen c8, has gone for a bit of a think. But Black can't touch the b pawn. As soon as you play move like b6, you immediately regret it, because in comes the knight to c6, which is why Anish has done exactly what he's done. With queen c8 rather than queen c7, and then bishop to d8, as the bishop not only attacked this knight on a5, which is protected by the queen, but you might play bishop b6, to trade off white's good dark square bishop and try to get some of these dark squares in the queen side for yourself. Yeah, bishop b I like bishop b6 cuz I'm envisioning a world where, you know, you've got a queen there ultimately controlling this entire diagonal. Uh okay, but bishop d but bishop d8 followed by rook e8 uh, because they like to keep us in suspense and guessing. White's best move here might be knight b3 c5. You know, because that seemed like his his whole position only makes sense in that direction. Right, you you He's really really want to get C five in. Never mind, he plays on the complete opposite side of the board. This is why commentators sometimes look silly. I don't know <laughs> if it's the best move, but no, I like Knight B three C five. I don't know, it seemed logical. Well, Anish has been playing instantly throughout this game, and now he's sitting there. I mean, it's hard to really see his expression because he's against what looks like, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know it. Is it a wall or is it a, uh, a dresser? Like, what's going on here? I don't know. And I don't know why the players just really enjoy cutting their faces in half, you know? Like, where are their webcams relative to their face? Like, is there a webcam on the other side of the room? Ali Reza sits like this. Fury sits like they're just. It's like a protest of some sort, you know? Like, we're not going to... Um, okay, we, we're going to give most of our attention to the game that we're looking at at the moment, but just quickly show the viewers what the heck is going on in Nizhny Grishuk, just very briefly. Okay, let's let's change that game over to Grishuk and Nizhny, and let's see what's going on here. This what? is an another game where if my students ever did this, I might kick them off the chess team. I mean, I like, might kick Nizhny and Grishuk off the chess team already. What is this? This is like, what? Oh, Robert, wait, 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 wait! I know we have it in the top right. I see it, but. And it, you might have looked as well, but how on earth would you predict what kind of an opening this came from? I didn't look, and I have no idea. I see a, no C, like initial C pawn went to C4, and this B2 pawn likely took on C3, so some sort of queen's pawn opening, but that is all I got for you. All right. Uh, it looks like it's a it's an exchange Rogozin with an early 94 and G5, and then, yeah, so these early Rogozins where you... Put the knight on e4 and then support it with g5. Mamid Yarov likes to play like this. I've never seen this in my life. Um, but you know, we did say we were gonna go look. Let, let's not get uh let's not get too distracted. We did say we were gonna go look at uh Yuri primarily for this round. But one uh, thing I, I will say about this position, which is all sorts of weird, is I like what Nizhnik's doing because clearly he anticipated this by his clock management, and Grishuk is already down three minutes on the clock in a very complex position. If you go F takes g3, say, hey, I'm up a pawn is black. After h takes g3, this rook is very happy on the open h file. The bishop can come to g2, hit the d5 square. The bishop on c8 is stuck, protecting the b7 pawn. So black's pieces, you know, they, they look fine for the time being, but it's not exactly clear what the future is. And the bishop on f2 doesn't look great for white, but it protects everything. So I like this opening, all things considered, for Nizhnik. Yeah, I don't know if Nizhnik played a novelty on move 12 uh, on purpose, but it is a novelty. The, the former game in this position... Uh, was actually Nico uh, Georgiatis, a uh, Swiss Grandmaster. They played this in the Swiss Championship. And against F5, he played G3. And uh, G3 looks pretty good. F4, at first, is not even looked at by the engine. So, and I mean, the, the tricky thing about these positions is that different engines evaluate these positions differently. 
So at first you might go, oh, white is doing very poorly here. Look what black is saying. But then you put it at a little deeper level on a better engine. And it's like, oh, actually white is better because it sees the future a little bit better. So you're absolutely right. Looks like Nizhnuk is completely in his, this looks like his prep, which is nuts because he just played a game with white where he was out of prep like move eight and lost move 15. So, you know, weird day me, for him. people are not going to be able to guess the move in this game. That's for sure. Because, you know, you can guess the move. The top uh, diamond member will get $50. It's been dragon B70 every single time. So I, let's, you know, I shouldn't even pretend like it's going to be anybody else. And uh, people who do not have memberships can win a diamond membership or other forms of membership at chess.com. So keep guessing the moves. We have been able to guess pr pretty much nothing from this game. And I want to point out another game uh, to our viewers is Faruja against Shimano because there's a knight on b7, which looks like it's a piece that's gone too far, but it's attacking this pawn on d6. So it's got this King's Indian vibe where it does feel like white is first of the action over here on the queen side. I, I'm not going to lie. I would not play a King's Indian against the guy who literally plays the King's Indian all the time. Yep. I'm, maybe I'm naive, but I don't think, I, I don't know a lot about Shimano's repertoire. So I'm very sorry if he is a, but I've seen him play in open tournaments and serious tournaments like closed events, St. Louis and everything. Um, I didn't think he was a. He, I think he's like a bit of a, a little specialist in everything. You know, he like plays a little bit of this, a little bit of that, some Benoni, some Grunfeld, but this just looks like a bit of a disaster for Black because he's not getting the attack started on the King side, and White has broken through on the Queen side. Which, if you do in the King's Indian, you basically win. I mean, that's yep. just how it works, right? There stole you go. A, stole a pawn to boot and. The one potential problem is this knight on b7. It is a very awkward piece, but it might just play back to d6 or even to a5 if the queen moves away from c6. And where is black's attack? You know, the compensation that you get from playing the king's Indian is like, well, your queen side is sort of in shambles, but you have a quick blistering attack on the king side. That's not the case here, and you're down the pawn. So this looks really bad for Shimanov and the wind. So let us go, I guess, back to the game between... The spicy caterpillar and, and Ishigiri because yep. uh, things, are, things are calm. They're about to open up, though, on the queen side. At least Ishigiri wants it to by playing a5, hoping to take with the pawn on the a file and get that rook on eight, which has, to this point, been doing nothing into the action. Though you know, you just know Ray Robson's considering playing with, like, c5. Yeah, I mean, it's it's either a3 or c5. It's, it's not b5 because uh, there's no point giving... Uh, you know, black to full control of the dark squares, especially considering your bishop's a light squared bishop. It's very important. You know, b5 at an elementary level, you look at it and you go, well, I can play b5, then I'll play c5. Uh, maybe, actually, you know, b5 and then c5 could potentially be something, and then black will actually have to take because otherwise you'll play c6. And that 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 will be a problem. Uh, but he does play a3. Uh, you can't. You yeah, can't. I mean, this uh, this is Sorry, exactly what, what Black needs, though, right? Because as you're pointing out, White's idea is very obvious. The C5 break and just pushing your pawns forward. It's very nice-looking position for White. And I, I would say, objectively, um, the position isn't as good for White as it first appears because Black does have some counterplay down the A file. So even if you do get the C5 push and you start trying to break on the queen side, like if Black can come up with concrete counterplay, then you'll still have a decent chance here. But I think it's easier to play as white, that's for sure. Yeah, it seems like white has a, a much more direct plan, but Anish does have more than double the time advantage of his opponent. Uh, okay, so I actually, I don't know why I didn't think of that move by Anish at all, but this is Anish saying that, well, is this really a move you want to play though? Like, what if C5? Because yeah. you're not worried about pawn takes f3 because queen f3, right? So, you know, uh, I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm with you. It looks like just favorable for, for white. You're, you're getting your uh, progress on the queen side. And on the king side, now things are opening up where the king on g8 is definitely not safer than the king on h1. So um, he played c5. He just goes forward here. And what he wanted, I believe, was some kind of, if you play f4 eventually, or maybe even the present position, playing bishop g4 trying to trade off your bishop on f5 that's not really doing anything, getting a rook to a2 in some kind of order, and getting your queen onto the g4 square. I know you're asking for a lot here, but that's the kind of thing that black really needs uh, for counterplay. And by playing c5 immediately, you're like, well, now you're not actually 
breaking open the position too soon. And if I get my queen to the F file, queen on F3, it's the F7 pawn that's the target. Yeah, everything everything you said is is absolutely accurate. In, in case you needed validation from a far weaker player, uh, and <laughs> um, I appreciate your support, Levy. Yeah, I I just don't know how could you have prevented C five. I mean, it just seemed like it wasn't so dangerous, and then a couple moves are played, and all of a sudden there's problems. I don't know how how could you? Maybe you could have stopped it. Well, I guess the problem is that white is going to have two pawns connected, like C and D. This is really the problem. If if white had played rook C5, it actually is a little bit less dangerous almost. I mean, with the E pawn on E4, not really, because there's always this opportunity to take and open the F file. But with the pawn on E5, you can put the queen on D6, at least. Right. That's sort of the point. But now you can't really do that because the position is very open. Well, uh, you actually, you're, you're kind of leading me to a good point that maybe instead of E4... Perhaps black could have started with like queen d7 or queen, maybe queen d7 because c5, now I take on c5 yeah. and you can't take back with a pawn because you lose the d pawn. So perhaps there was a tempo gaining move to activate your queen that would have given black some better chances because, um, you know, the queen on c8 is not well placed, that's for sure. And now if you play queen d7, you're walking into c6 with a tempo in many variations and you're just letting white advance the pawn. So even though material is level, it's the quality of the pawns that we like White's position. Okay, Robert, there are huge developments. Uh, first, let's go to Nizhnyuk Grishuk, where Ilya Nizhnyuk is completely winning. Seven minutes versus less than one now. Uh, I think uh, Grishuk slowly getting outplayed and then blundering this beautiful move, Knight C4. A couple moves back with the with the capture and then uh, and and then and then the pawn push. So it's over. I mean, Nizhnyuk's going to clean this up. Another development is that Firuja is no longer better as of a few moves ago. I mean, it's complete chaos here, but uh, from, from a couple moves back, uh, it seemed like White had everything under control, but, but Shimanov has turned this into a bit of a fight now. This is crazy. Whoa. I mean, look at this position. It's complete madness. Both, both players have pawn chains on their respective sides of the board. I have no idea what's going on. I'm not super, super confident that Shimanov can navigate all this with two and a half minutes, but wow. Uh, crazy stuff. And but we, a game we haven't looked at at all. Eric Hansen, probably a little bit better versus Corey, but down two minutes. And these guys have a lot of history. They've played each other plenty of times. Blitz, Arena Kings, these kinds of things. So uh, we'll see what happens. But Hansen's got to not lose. That's the most important thing right now. I think H Hansen's got to at least draw this game. Because if he loses, we might have ourselves a tied match. So... Yeah, this is all crazy. I mean, I'm looking at the Hansen game real quick because knight d5 is the move that comes to my mind. If you take on d5 with the pawn, then after pawn d5, your queen's under attack, your bishop is lost on c6, which leads me to believe that after knight d5, you take with the bishop on d5, and then we might even see some knight takes b6 stuff, and things are getting traded. Opposite color bishop is very unclear to me uh, who should be happy about that. So they've been repeating. Uh, he, sorry, he retreated bishop f2 and queen went back to d8. Let us keep just going around the games. I know it's going to be a bit of a whirlwind, but um Grishuk has 24 seconds left for instance and we have him on camera here with what is he down in exchange but he's trying to counter here on the g3 square so not clear at all i mean white is better of material but Grishuk trying to get his counter chances here oh yeah and and the worst part about playing Grishuk in low time situation is that he's going to move very quickly this is a really under underappreciated element of when you have a lot of time and they don't they're going to move very fast you're also kind of in time trouble. You don't have a huge amount of time to play all the moves. And the problem is, Grishuk's first instinct is going to be right like 97% of the time. The right. move that he has to play in one second is going to be a move that you either didn't expect, underestimated, right? Because that's what happens in time trouble. You're, part of you is not so much looking for the kill shot as much as you're looking for the opponent to just completely self-destruct. And when you play someone like Grishuk, it doesn't happen. And it might happen. Look at this. He's already lost the pawn, Ilya. Yeah, well, we, I didn't like rook f3. I thought bishop f3 was better, just protecting the pawn e2, keeping everything safe and sound. But now that he's got his rook on f3, so is he trying to check on e7? But now bishop takes g3 as a threat. So if you leave the queen on the e file, watch out for the bishop moving away and the queen now eyeing each other. So king h6, oh, is it rook f4 after king h6? Is this brilliant? Oh my gosh, king h6 it might be rook f4. The queen is undefended, so you can't take the rook. And I'm putting rook h4 checkmate. Uh, rook f4, yeah, that might be. There is queen h5. 
Ah, uh, but I, and I have rook h4 still because my queen protects the square, and even though my pawn is pinned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can I just can I repeat or am I losing? Can I just play like queen e2? Um, this is sorry if, if king on h6 rather. So instead of king oh, going oh, to g, oh. if the king went to h6. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, this is another really great point. Like here, you know, some some of our viewers might think, well, rook a3, rook a8, just winning. Like you know, I'm just looking. I'm just. I'm only looking at my own plans. You got to scan for checks for your opponents as well. And then bishop takes g3 here is just devastating. Not to mention queen h5, queen d1, if that didn't exist. But um, see, now we see this problem. Like Greece shoots down to nine seconds. As a human being, you are desperately, desperately hoping that they screw up. Especially when you play someone like Grisha. You play in the local club. You play in like a, a big open tournament. You're like, all right, I'm feeling confident. But you know this guy is going to be playing maximum resistance even with only nine seconds on the clock and that's what makes it so difficult i had this problem against you when we played man you're like a mini grisha i was like robert is down to like four seconds i got 40 minutes and then i was losing <laughs> you know it's just funny because grishuk is somebody who you, like you're saying you know that he's going to play accurately in time trouble so you don't want to just play on his time but i didn't like what nizhnik did a couple moves ago if you just go back to move 28 he went rook to f3 oh sorry i, I Keep going back and forth. Bishop f3 stops the queen from attacking the g3 square. It protects the pawn on e2. And then your king feels safer on h2, even if it's not super safe. So by playing rook to f3 instead, now queen takes e2. And I, white's king is also in pretty big danger. And it's a complex position where both sides have chances rather than just white. Yeah, he's, he's going for a think here. You almost kind of wish that uh, he had taken a little bit of time. Ferruja won his game, by the way. Okay, so he, yeah, he he was victorious, and I am curious if, uh, yeah, by timeout. So uh, Shimanov got into time trouble and ended up blundering. That's 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 ultimately what happened. Um, we we left the game at uh, at this moment, Queen C five, and uh, I guess there's some threats of, of Rook D seven. Wow, the computer is so brutal. The computer suggests after Queen C five to play King H eight, and if Rook D seven Sack the queen, cd7, rook c5, bc5, bishop e2, d8 queen, yep. takes, takes, and Robert, not bishop f1. Do you want to know what the top engine move here is? King g8 to prevent <laughs> knight f7. I mean, that, that is BS, Robert. That is... <laughs> oh my gosh, that is ridiculous. That is... no Nobody's finding that, and maybe there are other things along the way, but... Perugia was the one who ended up escaping with the victory because he, uh, well, his king went to e2. So e3 already, you're giving away your pass pawn. And it's just Shimano, very confusing position. The c pawn is very advanced as well. And he tries to get some counterplay, but after queen d5, queens are getting traded. White is up two pawns. But let us not keep our attention away from games that are still in progress. Rook f4 by Nizhnik played, and Grishuk played pawn to b5. What a move to play with very little time on your clock. Yeah, what, is, what does that do? He did have a draw. He definitely had queen h5, queen e2. Wow. Wait, queen on b2? I don't like bringing the queen over there. That's for sure. So that what if you wrong. just push? Just a5, a6? So give up the rook and start pushing the pawn. That's one idea. Um, I, I think he can also take on b5, right? a, b5, bishop f4, g, f4. And after queen takes b5, like queen c7. Can I just take on c7 and my f4 pawn is protected. My d pawn is trying to roll. Oh, this man. is This is con confusing. And by the way, Ray Robson has won his game against Anish Giri. Wow, that is huge. Wow. All, all sorts of confusion this round. So Robson wins because he's getting a queen. Oh, look at these connected pass pawns that he was able to operate with. And we we're being told earlier that on move 31, it appears that some kind of somewhere there was some rook takes c5 stuff. I don't know where. Oh my gosh, right here. On move 30, rook takes c5 was a tactical shot missed by uh, both players. <laughs> both players, probably. I mean, I, 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 I assume Ray also missed it with queen d6 ultimately. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's, that's big. Wow. Uh, Feruja, I mean, everyone's coming in the clutch right now. Like, Feruja with the, with this big win, kept the pressure up. Hansen does not have a lot of time against Corey, but Hansen is better. He is he is putting the pressure, putting in the work. He's uh, completely equal position, but big time. But but Eric's got 20 seconds, and Eric is, is not a mini Grishuk. 
I've seen him in the you know in the past these time trouble positions is like against the Turizaga in that match against the Marshals. He he that position was nuts and he ended up losing it. But this position does feel very low risk for White. You know, it it just does not strike me like there's a lot of counterplay right now. So he can continue to hold, get Corey also low on time, and then uh, and then convert it. But let's yeah. stick to I mean, of course. No, let's go to the Grishuk game. You're right. But I was looking at the Hansen game thinking like, I mean, everything has to cover E4. So you're right. It does just feel good for White, but it's one of those sticky positions where it can be, it's very easy to just blunder upon and within the game. And here we see that Nizhik does take on B5 and he is 25 seconds left himself. So we're in for a <laughs> blitz battle. That's what I said, man. I, yep. I, I said it. This is the problem. This is the problem playing guys like Grishuk is that they do this to you, man. Like, but two seconds. Not- Oh, I don't man, like I... his king on the first rank because the pawn is trying to promote with the check, but you need your queen to protect F4. So D6 not possible yet. Queen E5, I like that move. Oh, and Queen E7, D6. This is the idea to get the two pawns together. Oh, that, so that looks D6, nice. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think this is just a winning endgame. I think this is this is a split-second decision, uh, and it's the wrong one. Grishuk has, 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 has transitioned this into a completely lost endgame. Yeah, because F5 is a goner. Yeah. And here's King G5. You just take oh. his H pawn. Yeah. So this is this is the brutal thing is you survive these positions for so long and then you make one bad transitional mistake. Now bishop c4 is a threat to get the bishop out in d7. Now you can't play it now. King's too close. But yeah, it's over. Wow. Yep. Wow, wow, wow. And emotionless. Both players completely emotionless. Grishuk just kind of goes, damn it, why'd I get into time trouble? And the chess world goes, you're not upset about that. <laughs> Let us go to the other game, by the way. There's a queen sack and it's about to be a checkmate. It looks like rookie two check. There's just king g3, but then you can't go rook g8. The move you need to stop the checkmate because if the rook g8 is queen takes f7 check, you can only have rook g7, and I win the piece on g7. So it rookie five, but now you're just giving away all your material. So Hanson coming in clutch, and Corey is just in, you know, he's just in pain right now. Wow. Robert, go back to move 43. I know some of our viewers were like, no worries, don't, don't look at the engine. But this, this, is, this is important because we don't do this to, to say that we know more than the players. On, on move 42, everything was going correctly. Bishop takes g4, and then this, this move f6. And Eric Hansen only evaluated bishop f6 because obviously the threat is queen h6, queen g7. But in this position, there's the brilliant move bishop takes h2. And it wins! It wins. It's winning for black. It wins because apparently, check this out. This is this is filthy. King yep. h2, check. Rookie, rookie two. Yep. And then if bishop f2, black has to find the move. Well, there's two moves, but I think the prettier one is bishop h5. Nice. I was going to say king h7, but bishop h5 makes sense. The queen can't take on h5 because rook f2 check takes back on f6, and you have two rooks and an attack for the queen. Absolutely unbelievable. And again, we only show these things because it just shows the unbelievable complexity i'm not sitting here going Corey, what are you doing how did you not find this i mean this position complete chaos and eric hansen is coming up huge today for the bras tremendous yeah. i mean just wow like two it, out of three for him and yeah it's huge performance and uh two and a half out of three actually for um for Hanson and this bishop on g4 not being capturable that's the main point is you take with the queen there's rook to g8 if there was king takes g4 there was rookie four check and you win the queen that way so an unbelievable sequence you play f6 in time trouble thinking you're just going for mating attack it shouldn't pan out but it does with all that being said it is the chess bros match to lose they're up seven to five we'll be back for the final round of action in just a few minutes
A premium membership at chess.com will help you improve your game with full access to a powerful set of learning tools. Unlimited tactics let you practice like a master with more than 50,000 puzzles to challenge you at every level. Our library of interactive chess lessons created by master coaches will enhance every aspect of your game. And after each game you play, the computer analysis feature will give you feedback on every move you played, turning every game into a chance to learn. And that's not all. Premium benefits also include unlimited tournaments, video lessons, the opening explorer, and much, much more. Upgrade now to take your game to the next level. And we are back looking at the playoff bracket from the 2020 Pro Chess League playoffs. We have three of four semifinalists confirmed that those teams are the China Pandas, St. Louis Archbishops, Armenia Eagles, who await their challenger in either the Canada Chess Bras or Chicago Wind. So, Levy, with one final round left here, do you think that the Chicago Wind have a chance to move on to the semis? Uh, yeah. I mean... I, I don't I don't I don't think that's a that's a super crazy hypothesis. I, I guess the bigger question would be if Canada does make it uh, and then they have to play Armenia, who do I root for? Uh, do I root for the team that, that defeated New York or do I root for the team to beat the team that defeated New York? And or do I just root for the team that's the fourth uh, semifinalist? You know, like I said, we've, we've had Armenia, we've had St. Louis, we've had China before. We've seen all these teams. There's always that fourth rotating team. Baden-Baden, uh, Ljubljana. And now, probably the scariest threat to them all, Canada, right? Um, so, we we typically think of Canadians as very peaceful and friendly, but not when they have this lineup of Grishuk, Giri, Faruja, and then either Ivan Saric or Eric Hansen on board four. But kudos to Hansen. Look at that score: two and a half out of three, the high score of the entire match. And his teammates, he's actually lifting them up rather than the other way around. Yeah, that's actually pretty crazy. I have to apologize. I, uh, I I said two because I thought he drew two games and won last round. But uh, sometimes when you do commentary, you say things that are just completely untrue uh, by mistake or 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 on purpose, uh, depending on how your character is built. But two and a half out of three is unbelievable. That is, he's the highest score of the eight players, uh, and he he he's living up to to potential here. I mean, this is like we've seen Hanson struggle, we've seen Sarge struggle, but. Eric is really, really good. I mean, we're talking about a, another guy who people, he, he's been touted as like, you know, by Hikaru uh, saying that he has a chance to even become a 2,700 rated player. So, you know, Hikaru speaks, every, the world listens. Uh, so, it's, well, you know, there, there we go. Uh, are we going to stick with Hansen or what are we going to do? Who, where are we going? Let's, uh, let's do it for the boys. Let's stick, let's go on Hansen's game for the time being because, uh, that's a really critical one. It's about evenly rated matchup. And Shimanov was going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Faruja there. And he, unfortunately, for the Chicago win, was not able to pull it off. But what I was going to say is Corey, you know, he had reached up just about 2,700 at some point, And he's 0 out of 3 in this matchup. That is completely unexpected. And even a single point out of those three games for him would make this match a tie. So Chicago, all credit to them. Ray Robson and Nizhnik both have 2 out of 3 points facing off against extremely highly rated op opposition, but Corey is sort of the weak link for the team in this match. Yeah, that last game would have been huge if he had found, I mean, Bishop takes H2, and obviously the whole calculation was very, very difficult to find, but um, let's, you know, that's a point that, it, it's a two-point margin, but when you take a point away from one side and add it to the other side, it's 6-6, six, six, and this is anybody's match. And the problem now is that uh, you just, you know, you, you need everybody to win. I mean, there's no room for error. One and a half points seals the match. And, well, we see Grishuk starting out against Robson. Grishuk plays, plays like this to be a little nefarious. He plays uh, like his King's Indian attacking style, but we also see Shimanov busting out like this weird sideline-ish London, and that also gives the position a little distinct flavor so maybe trying to take his opponent out of a comfort zone just scanning around all the other openings uh cory versus Ferruja. is cory's strategy right now to just not lose just make a draw against Ferruja? like what is the strategy you know 
Well, he um, is the white pieces. So honestly, if you're the Chicago wind, you sort of need him to play for more because you're down two points with the white pieces against Ferruja. They had that match several months back. I believe it was in November in the Netherlands where Ferruja dominated the match. But, you know, Corey took a game off of him, and he can do that in a single game uh, right now. But he has to be careful because he's not in good form in Ferruja blitzing out his opening. Yeah, Ferruja played with tremendous confidence in that match. I think he won the first three or four games. Uh, Corey is playing for a win. I mean, Long Castles in... In Queen's Gambit decline structures with G4, this is obviously, you know, so this is, the problem for him is that if he loses four points go to Canada by defeating Jorge Corey, which is nearly half, or it's, I guess slightly, slightly less uh, than, than, than half of what you need to win the match with eight and a half. So that is, that is enormous. All right, that, that, that is, that's a bummer. I mean, obviously he's going to be disappointed, but I, I don't know if this is the right strategy. I mean, Robert, first of all, what is White's next move in this in this game in particular to start an attack? Yeah, like, it's, a, it's a good question because on one hand, G4 looks menacing because you're trying to push forward on the king side, but the other hand, you're leaving behind many weak squares, one of which is H4. That's like, well, what does H4 matter here? Let's say bishop E4, D E4, and I move my knight back somewhere, like the G1. This queen can hop into H4, put pressure on F2 at some point some moment not to mention just simple development should be good for black with the two bishops just knight f6 and yeah i'm not really liking the initial setup but rook f1 he'll or king b1 getting his king away maybe a bishop to c1 there it is and all right you need to play quickly you know he's not playing the best chess in the world but if you can keep up with Farouge on the clock that will be his best chance Keeping up with Ferruja on the clock is is difficult in any time format. Probably the most difficult in like hyper bullet or bullet, but uh, he's already coming to fight. I mean, Bishop B4, nice move, putting some pressure. I kind of like what 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 Corey has has figured out here. I'm I'm surprised that Ferruja played Knight F8. That's not a Ferruja move. I would have expected B5. Just go for it, you know. Yeah. Just B5. If I, but I, I mean, obviously, he hasn't done anything wrong. Although Robert, I gotta say, it feels a bit strange to put the Knight on G6. Because isn't it just going to be a target in the future? It's what we're saying in that uh, Robson versus Ferruja game, where pawns, in many ways, want minor pieces in front of them. H4, H5 would come with the tempo now. Granted, you can't really get H4 off very easily with the pawn on uh, G4 under attack. But knight E2, a very natural move, saying, hey, I'm sidestepping any kind of capture on C3. Now this knight can choose where to go. Maybe I'll go to G3 and try to uh, even land on the F5 square. And if you take on G3... This pawn structure doesn't look ideal for white, but e3 is safe and sound. The bishop on c1 covers it. The semi-open f-file should be good news uh, for white. And, you know, maybe there's some kind of even knight h4, h4, h5 type of stuff. As you're pointing out, this knight on g6 is kind of awkwardly placed. Definitely. I mean, right now the problem is, is the g4 pawn hanging is, but... Um... I don't know. Um, I, I, and, and notice Corey kind of did the same thing. He, well, not, not, not the same thing as Farouge is doing, but he kind of did like the same ideology. He's like, I don't want any pieces in front of my king because they're going to be targets. So there's no pieces and his pawns are sticking back. Like he could play a three to kick the, the bishop away, but that could be a target for b5, b4 in the future. So uh, credit to him for making this a fight. But man, Farouge is rolling. This guy, not, not like, you know, the narcotics way. He, he's rolling in this position. He's singing, he's bopping. And, and that's, a sign of confidence uh, from him. And he's also up on time playing, you know, super fast. I think there's a psychological element to this. I've beaten you before. I could do it again. But let's not forget that when Ferruja has to defend unpleasant positions, he doesn't always do it the best way, right? So there is that moment uh, from, from Corey. He gets this game into any sort of territory that's a little bit disadvantageous to Black. He might have some chances. But right now it's not looking... Great, as Ferruja takes a... Is that Red Bull? Was that Red Bull, Robert? <laughs> I, I didn't catch it, but uh, you know I wouldn't be surprised. And Yeah, this is a very critical moment for Corey because if he doesn't do something now, he might just get rolled over. And right now, you see Bishop E4, D E4, Knight takes D7, Queen D7, something like this. It's still better for uh, Black, but this is the type of thing that you know White may have to just kind of bite the bullet and say, all right, I'm going to be worse off but let me try to hold here and hope that my teammates can do well. And I see Wesley so in the game chat being like, yeah, the opening didn't go well for Corey. Um, you know, he thinks that Corey's about to lose this one again. <laughs> he says, oh, one easy, not good. Not good news at all. 
So, yeah, I mean, Wesley uh, Wesley wrote easy with a Z. That's how you know he's for real, you know? It's kind of like the, put the gun sideways. That's how you know they're for real. Like, Wesley... He's he just Wesley referencing wrote... Easy e you know, the rap, rapper from the 90s who passed away too soon. Oh, I thought you meant G-Easy. Okay, yeah. No. Wow, and now he says, Corey should just play for a dry every game. Wow. I mean, Wesley is, like, the nicest human, but his haymakers are for real. Like... When he said earlier before the games got underway, he said, Ferruja and Grishuk make France and Russia proud. That's what he said. That was, man, I mean, that is like a, that is a dig if I've heard one. The, the shade is tremendous. There is no sunlight when this guy, when this guy brings his, uh, you know, his, 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 his tongue lashings to the game. But, okay, Robert, let's, let's analyze this for a second. I mean, C5 does look like a problem. But what if you just take on e4 and then take the bishop on d7? Is it yeah. so? Oh, yeah, actually, taking on d7, can you play cd4? Well, no, because if a cd4, there's queen b3, and the bishop on b4 requires the defense of the queen on e7, right? So uh, you can't take back on d7 without losing your bishop on b4. So, okay. I mean, essentially, that line that you know, I was mentioning earlier with you trade everything and take on d7, then the white queen will have to go to b3 or something. Black is just better, has more control over the board. The bishop on c1 is pretty useless piece honestly and black is more active and has no weaknesses to speak of so not a good sign if you are Jorge Corey here and he played queen to e2 hoping to keep things a little bit uh, more complicated but I think the complications still favor Perugia's position yeah I think his idea is c4 and then simplifying and then just trying to make sure that nothing gets opened up uh quick scan of the games uh Shimon of Hansen in the balance very unclear what's going to happen in that game. The only thing symmetrical is the pawn structure and, like, what's been traded. Grishuk is, uh, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I get what he's doing against Robson. It just looks hilarious. This is the world championship match of the time-troubled players. <laughs> um, Anish Giri is probably equal, but maybe slightly a slight argument that he's, or not a slight argument, an argument that he might be slightly worse because... Nizhnik's got a very strong bishop on g7, uh, but nothing nothing substantial. Uh, I, li so, I like Nizhnik's position, though. Well, because, then that, it has us there you go. I mean, that's a. That's well, you, your instinct is certainly right because you know, what, essentially you have to ask them what are the plans for each side? What is white's plan here? I'm not really sure. For black, after queen c4, you know, this, where did the queen come from? The queen came from e4, and then after queen d3, said, I don't want to trade queen d3. What about just queen f5? Because I want to just double my rooks in the E file at some moment, put pressure on the D4 pawn, the E2 pawn. And if you play queen D3 back, hoping that I'm just going to uh, trade queens, I, I mean, I guess I can't play rook E4 like I wanted to because rook C5 happens and then I lose my rook on E4. So I tried. I was uh, hoping for glory. Instead, I just have pain. That's okay. It's kind of a microcosm of my entire existence. Mm -hmm. um, so... Do we trade queens of Pernishnuk? No, we don't, because we need to win the game. And um, Bra's offering draw. Oh, ha ha <laughs> have the Bra's offered a draw on every board? Man, how does Ray Robson have less than three minutes soon to be on move 12? I mean, he's afraid of some kind of F5, I guess, but. Well, I, I, yeah, but like, come on, man. Oh, and he, gotta... there, he, there it is. There it is. He moved. So he's allowing pawn f5 because he's going to play pawn e4 as a response. And that hits the knight on f3. There's bishop g3 check, which wins the knight on h4. So this would be madness and madness that favors black. Yeah, I guess some e4. Yeah. That's the tough thing about Ray is that he's really dedicated to finding what he thinks is the best move, tactically speaking. But sometimes. And, you know, he loves to analyze. He loves this, this, this process of, like, discovery, analysis, evaluation, back to discovery. And then I mean, it's, that, that's really how the chess logical process works. But the problem is that you're going to run out of time. Like, you got three minutes. At some point, you do have to play on instinct. But we did see Grishuk today suffer a defeat. It's not something we see very often. Uh, in, in, in tactical fashion, it did look like he was getting back into the game despite being in time trouble. So now Grishuk is going to go for a thing. You know, and Levy, I was going to say, without, with the exception of the Corey game, I like the wins position on most boards. Um, this game is complex. I think Grishuk objectively is better, but they'll both get into time trouble and crazy things will happen. 
But Shimano's position, at least from an initial glance, it looks like he's making some progress. I mean, just pulling up the board here, there's a knight on e5, a pawn on e6. Maybe it's just you've overextended and you're actually going to lose this pawn on e6. But some, something just like feels like it's going in the right way for Shimano here. It feels that way. Uh, and it's another, you know, n- another moment and a important game for Hansen where he, he might have a better position, but he's slowly going to get into time trouble. I don't know how much, you know, how much of a mind game Shimanov will play in terms of just playing quickly and bluffing a little bit, because obviously these guys are the same strength. Uh, approximately, I mean, if they're going to be offended that I said that, I'm very sorry. One of them well, might think that they're better than the other. But uh, yeah, what were you going to say? I had a freak out because let's go to the Corey game. I'm sorry oh. to keep you know shifting gears here, but look at this position. What in the world is happening? Like, is, is Ferusha going to get mated? There's a pawn on g6, which means queen h5, queen h7 checkmate ideas are about to happen. What is happening? Yeah, this is crazy. I mean, I guess you got to go bishop a3. It's the only thing that makes sense because then you're going to go queen b4, but because rook c2 doesn't work. Rook c2, queen h5, as you said. You, you know, you're, you know, queen h5 is coming, so you need to prevent it. Bishop a3, queen h5. There is probably bishop c2. That's probably winning, right? If queen h5, then, then check on c2, and then you take with check. Very important. Um, then, then your queen gets into b4 and the white king is getting mated first absolutely yeah so you can't play queen h5 so you need to play bishop a3 but if you play bishop a3 maybe pawn takes f6 as you said like who is mating who <laughs> I, <laughs> not, uh, not to quote you right back to you but uh, i don't have the answers and i have questions with no answers but it, both sides feel very vulnerable here and... Yeah, I wonder, man, I would love to, 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 to know what's going on in their heads. Like, is Corey thinking, you know, ah, oh, damn, I'm, you know, I'm just going to throw everything at him, and if I lose, I lose, it doesn't matter, I've had a bad day. Or is he going, like, wait a second, I could really, I could really win this thing, maybe. Like, there's some chances, and is Ferruja going, do I even have to win? We're up two. Well, this game's, I could draw this game. It's not a problem, you know. Well, um, drawing the game might be the biggest problem. In theory, to draw would be not a problem. Okay, because but- of the other positions you're saying. No, I'm saying because this position is crazy. Like, I don't know who's getting made and who's winning and who's... Okay. I, I don't it, know, it. man. Like, you're, you're Bishop A3, right? So GF6, uh, GF6, some kind of Knight G4, I'm thinking. And... That's a problem. Knight F6 is coming, Knight H6, Knight F5, G7. But, but maybe there's Bishop C2 check. I have to sack my Queen on C2. And if a Rook C2... I mean, I'm just, like, going with it for a second. Knight takes up six check. I'm trying to take this rook with check on e8. So king h8, g7. Um, this is like, might be one of like the more forcing lines. But... Oh, you might, yeah, yeah. You might have bishop a3 with tempo as well. You get all their pieces. Oh my gosh, that would be crazy. <laughs> g7, knight e8, king c2. And then it's a draw because it's perpetual somehow. Yeah, probably, right? Just, or, where a king goes somewhere, I don't know where. And then they take, and there's a million checks on this exposed king. The queen d3 check. And the king is probably not going to be able to run away, but it's just pure chaos. Yeah, this is nuts. And Ferruja now has to calculate. So his time advantage is it's going to go bye-bye. I mean, unless, you know, Corey tanks as well soon. He's got to be calculating intensely uh, as, uh, as Ferruja's thinking. And Ferruja's, like, leaning off screen right now, just uh, trying to think deeply about this position. And Corey, I mean, you can see the position in his glasses, the reflection. He <laughs> is just really just eyes on the board saying, I'm letting my team down by going 0 for 3 so far, but if I can win this game, I give my team a chance. Yeah, he's he's plugged in. You see there in the back, and also mentally, we got we got a uh, got Ferruja rocking the deltoid cam. Nice little bend there into into the bicep and the uh, man. He's he must be he must be working out in preparation for next year's tournaments. <laughs> gonna because you know he's gonna have to carry his team. Huh? Look, I see what you're doing there, but look at his face. He is really thinking deeply. He's probably trying to analyze if that line we were looking at before with. Black losing all of his pieces, but getting an active queen and all the checks, if that's actually a draw. Because if he doesn't see a repetition somewhere, he is going to love two rooks and a knight for a queen and a big attack on that barren black king. So uh, he's trying to work hard here. As for bishop a3, maybe there are other moves as well, some kind of knight c4 or something like that to consider as well. So it's not just a one-track mind of gf6. There could be some sort of knight c4. Dude, man, this is, this is a huge, huge moment. Uh, because, you know, we, we saw a game like this in, in when it was Parham Hikaru, and Parham tanked for a moment and played a variation that the engine didn't like, but it was complete chaos. He sacked a piece, 
and he didn't find the best way. Then he got, they both kind of took turns navigating the waters, not necessarily finding all the, you know, all the best moves with the, with the time situation. Look at this. We both have two players with two and a half minutes. If Ali Reza tanks here and doesn't find the right decision, he could lose, which could be in, enormous. I mean, that would be a huge plot twist. Wesley so saying he has to find Bishop A3. Apparently nothing besides Bishop A3 works. And he's played Rook C2. Uh-oh. Oh my goodness. What has he calculated? Maybe Rook B2, right? Only logical move here, Rook B2. You have to go Rook B2. And maybe nothing else. Maybe Rook B2, King B2, Bishop A3 check, King A1 only move because King B1 runs into Queen B4, Queen B2 is checkmate after that. And after King A1, there's Bishop B2 check, just hoping that you're going to kind of ensnare the king, but I won't take you on B2. That would lead to a forcing checkmate with Queen B4 check. I'll play King B1 and run away with my king. So like, mm -hmm. you can get a bunch of checks in, but I do think that the white king is running away successfully. So I, I don't know what Ali Reza calculated here. Obviously, both, both checks look good. Bishop a3. He's played bishop c3. I was going to say, he probably calculated this and thinks it's a win, or at least a draw, with, with rook c8. But now knight c4, queen a3, king d2, queen b4, king e2, and the king runs to the king side. Yep. You know, you could have my knight on c4, but here comes my king running away. Oh and my gosh. This is, this, this is unbelievable. This is... Uh... What did he miss is the question, right? That's always the question. Well, did he think he had rook c4 and then queen a3 and some mating that? Like, oh. <laughs> there's complete pandemonium in this game. Yeah. And I, Wait, what are you thinking? I was going to say rook c4, king and queen c7. Maybe he thought it was winning, but he missed like king b4. I, I don't know. Like, you just you just never know what these superstar players miss. King b4, wait, Robert, king b4, a5, king a4, queen c4, king a5. And there's no mate. And there's no perpetual. Like... <laughs> Because if you check on a6, the king comes back to b4. Wow, what I mean, this is ridiculous. And he's still thinking here, which is bad sign because he's down him in and in a lost position. So let us just try to get a, a broader view of the you know of all the boards because every single point matters here. So I'm gonna quickly go through the action. It looks like Eric Hansen here with the black pieces. He I would say I like his position slightly better, but still very complicated. As um, you know, there's a the bishop on b7 eyeing the pawn on g2 in an attack, but this pawn e6 is still a bit of a thorn in black side, and the king on h7 maybe isn't the happiest piece in the world, but I do like Hansen's position. We have Robson against Grishuk. Robson's king has found shelter on the queen side, but white has the bishop pair, so even though the material is level, the bishop pair looks advantageous, so slight advantage to white, but 13 seconds left. Robson, you can't do this, buddy! Yeah, this is this is, this is is really, really wild. Um, I mean, Grishuk just very comfortably better here. Could play this position forever. Um, and then Nizhny Giri is, is looking like it's going to be a draw. That would be a really lukewarm finish. You know, if the bras draw three games and lose one in the final round, but that's enough because that's eight and a half. Um, yeah, my money's on Grishuk to win, though. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that, that'll get him to eight. And then the players are just going to have to go all out. You know, I, I don't know how much monitoring of each other's games the players do. There's still obviously room for blunders. Uh, but I don't, I, I don't see Anish screwing this up, and I, I don't see Grishuk not winning, which is a problem. Yeah, so. and Hansen as well now with the queens off the board. Uh, he just put his rook on d1. That's a pretty brutal pin. The threat is bishop takes g2 or knight takes g2 as the bishop on f1 is pinned. So Hansen also, he might go three and a half out of four. Oh my, That'll bishop g2, it's just over. Bishop g2. Oh, he, it's his move. Wow, I was just saying bishop g2 is a possibility, but that's a free pawn, and that's a that's insane. Piece. He's going to get three and a half. <laughs> Eric Hansen, everybody. The champion the people need it. I mean, this is... What? Hello? <laughs> this, this dude just got three and a half out of four. It's a 3,000 <laughs> performance. You know, Shimano have had to cover the G2 square with like F3. Still looks good for Black, but he just walks right into a one-move blunder and down goes his bishop on F1. Hansen is... He's, he's just the legend, honestly. This is crazy. I mean, uh, someone says, Eric, carrying, take away a couple of those words. As Shimonov is crying uh, a couple of those letters. I mean, Shimonov, just a disastrous day. Like, I mean, he's, he's, he did okay. But I mean, some of these losses for him just, you know, coming in, in, in low time situations. And wow, this is unbelievable. Um, yeah, this is over. So let's get rid of this game for now. Hansen will win it. Corey game, it feels like finally Corey's king went to safety. He won by resignation. That's a big win for the wind, and they needed to win the other two boards. So let's go to Nizhnik against Giri. Hey, wait, what happened here? The knight 
can come to g6 and back to f4 as needed. Um, Rook e7 feels like a pretty good move for white. So only white can be better, and white is probably much better in an endgame like this. This is, uh, if you've got to pick one game of the entire match that that was the most important, I still am sticking to the win with black for Eric against uh, against Nizhnyk. Because that took the win, oh, I mean, I can't really say that because in the very next game, Nizhnyk beat Grisha. <laughs> but it boosted Hansen. And it just, I mean, it does things for your your confidence. You're, you know, you're, you're like feeling it. And then he goes three and a half out of four. Like, of all the predictions to make, you know, I would have said like two for him, they would win the match because solidity is is super important. But Grishuk has won, by the way, so um, he, you know, they've got they've got eight now, so they need to draw on 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 any of the uh, remaining boards. Um, and well, like Shimanov is obviously that game is still going, so they're gonna get it, and it's it yeah, is yeah. Uh, it is over. Hanson's up like fifty pieces here, and in fact, he won <laughs> he won on time. She might have not resigning, saying that I, I would have won the game, but time uh, <laughs> time was a problem for me. So nine and a half, six and a half. It seems like the most popular scoreline in these quarterfinals. Every single match thus far has been nine and a half, six and a half. There you go. There you go. Um, but yeah, this last game might be uh, might be drawn. But yeah, I mean, huge congratulations to to Canada. Uh, I would say this is expected, but maybe not in the way we expected it. Would that be fair, Robert? Is that a, is that a fair uh, fair assessment? Yeah. I think if before the match I'd ask you or you'd ask me, what do you think is going to happen? Nine and a half, six and a half seems a reasonable score. The chess bras were higher rated on every board. With I mean, the wind really needed to take out Hansen because he is by far the lowest rated player in the chess bra lineup. He's shown some inconsistent results in the pro chess league throughout its entire history. But today, Hansen was on another level. So, we're going to take a brief break just so we can get an interview set up for you. And we will have one of the chess bras to talk about this match.
A premium membership at chess.com will help you improve your game with full access to a powerful set of learning tools. Unlimited tactics let you practice like a master with more than 50,000 puzzles to challenge you at every level. Our library of interactive chess lessons created by master coaches will enhance every aspect of your game. And after each game you play, the computer analysis feature will give you feedback on every move you played, turning every game into a chance to learn. And that's not all. Premium benefits also include unlimited tournaments, video lessons, the opening explorer, and much, much more. Upgrade now to take your game to the next level. Chess bras is plural, so we had to bring in two of them. Anish Giri, Eric Hansen, congratulations on a great match victory. Thanks, Robert. Thank it definitely didn't play out the way I expected. <laughs> it, it, essentially, it exceeded all of your wildest expectations, didn't it? It, it did, although uh, I can say the way things started, like coming into the match, everyone's like, you guys are big favorites. But when it comes to the playoffs, man, it's like, it's like people step up their game. And, and I knew from the beginning today it wouldn't, be, uh, wouldn't go just business as usual. Gentlemen, my, my first question, Obviously, both of you have uh, different priorities in the next coming days. But uh, as it pertains to this match, maybe starting with Anish, uh, how serious do you take this stuff? And to what degree was there any preparation whatsoever on your end? And just how, how are you feeling now? And how are you feeling about your upcoming match against Armenia? Yeah, well, I, obviously, as this match is already qualifying us to the, to the finals, I, you know, I took this sort of more seriously than others uh, in sense that I agreed to play a lot more readily, let's say. I mean, uh, normally I'd probably hesitate because I traveled the last two days and I should be preparing for some other things right now, but I thought, okay, let's, uh, you know, let's sort of do this. And uh, yeah, as it played out, it was very beautiful. I mean, the, the chess bra just uh, brought it home and uh, yeah, it, was, it was just beautiful to watch. And we also, all the other players sort of, Nicely sucked, and it was just beautiful. <laughs> so, in other words, you made Eric into the hero that he needed to become. Yeah, exactly. I mean, as I told him before the last round, you know, we are we are his wings, and now he's got to fly. So, <laughs> and he's really, really beautiful. Play, he really played the role because one of the biggest hurdles uh, for me is that I'm also managing for the most part, like pretty much everything. So, getting the guys to coordinate with their travel schedule, obviously. Playing the candidates is usually top priority, so uh, I'm very happy that uh, Anish and uh, Sasha both agreed to play, uh, but it wasn't always uh, going to be like that, or at least we didn't prepare for that. So that was already half the battle, and then then when, when it actually started, yeah, Anish, Anish started putting the pressure on me. Um, so so it definitely, definitely played out, uh, I guess, in my favor. I don't know how. I mean, Eric, what did you do differently this week compared to other Pro Chess League weeks? Because you were a superstar. I I, I didn't do much different. I did sit out last week, and um, uh, that was the first week I sat out. And I guess that's also the first week there's technically no Canadians on the team. So I did put myself back in this week, uh, and and I knew it would be like it would be testing. Um, but uh, all I did was I guess uh, self isolate what we normally do. I mean we're not leaving the house. Uh, I have I have one of our members visiting Canada right now, Aryan Tari. So maybe he's uh, providing some good vibes as well over here. But otherwise, the goal was just to try to be solid and let the let the big three uh, do do most of the most of the work. But that didn't happen. So you know, you <laughs> it yeah, I must it say, didn't. Eric Eric has also been self isolating himself for the last few years yes. for professionally. So probably he, I had an adva advantage he, there. Yeah, he's sort of coping with the circumstances much better than the rest of the world. No, it was like, it was like uh, I took a quick draw round one, uh, Ray offered, and um, that I was following the strategy, but it came, became very clear our positions weren't very good throughout this match. And then uh, Ilya was trying to kill everyone, and he just had a really bad opening against me. So I just took my chances. I, I really was like, I guess I, I took advantage of the fact that I think the other team felt like, obviously, I was a weakness, board four, so they had to maybe play more risky against me or just take a few more chances than they normally would and, and that opened things up and when I play well this season I do you know I put up big scores but I've also had some awful weeks so it was just one of those weeks where 
where things went my way. I've just been super inconsistent this season. Robert, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put uh, Eric specifically on the spot. I was just gonna ask him because we've we've had a lot of talk this year in the Pro Chess League about you know the rating cap and all the you know, a bloodbath as the season was beginning. And obviously, you know now the no rating cap does play in Canada's favor. They have made the semifinals, but I've always argued that this is gonna do good things for chess as an esport. I mean, if you guys don't know, Eric, I mean, is like fully involved in that. I mean, it, I think he like has an esport, literally a company. So I was just gonna ask Eric if you could give any details as to like what you've done over the course of this season uh, to help chess as an esport. Um, you know, some of the things that you're working on with Chess Bra. Well, I think, I mean, with, with this season and opening up the rating cap, the, the one thing it allows is to bring more uh, well-known names from chess, uh, more superstars now. That doesn't come, you know, let's say for free. So it also puts pressure on teams, not, not necessarily bad pressure to uh, look for sponsorship. But things that, that happen in other sports, in other esports, where, you know, from a prize fund, big teams, big names, and everyone does their job trying to get viewership, raise uh, momentum funds, things like that. So for us, we put in a more serious recruiting effort. Um, although the only big free agent that we signed that we didn't really know beforehand was was Grishuk and I'm really happy that he's able to play for us Anish Anish has been on our team for a few years Faruja is like uh, he's a young guy so he sort of grew up on the internet so he I think this format you don't need to convince him very much he was going to land on some team and he was interested in the league regardless and, and he wanted to play for us uh, and Anish has been on our team so for the most part um, our team was got the roster down and then the next thing is just trying to let everyone know uh, about the league and, and market it as well as possible get Yasser every week that helps um, we did the full broadcast and we just try to uh, uh, give away for for people to follow the league I mean it's not always easy to find the information so that's one thing we were trying to do a bit more this year and I mean now we got merchandise which is like the next step for people want to support the team there's an outlet right there and and hopefully with things like the live I'm a big fan of live finals. Uh, so I was really happy like us making it because that's going to open up even more things that happen in sports and esports, which is maybe like autograph sessions, Q and a sessions, meetups, and just bringing all the online engagement uh, to real life to, to in person. So um, just steps, steps at a time, but uh, um, I think it's been going well so far. Like we got the names we wanted and, and, and obviously the way our, our results have played out, uh, I've I've been pretty pretty happy with, but it wouldn't have been possible without some some financial support and and, and outreach and everyone doing their job and, and trying to promote promote the league. For sure, and that's a great answer. Thank you for being so thorough. And I mean, my final question is for you, Anish, because of course you have the candidates coming up. So you've been preparing for a long time now. What are these final few days? before the start of the tournament like? I mean, you just played, of course, some very tough players in this Pro Chess League match, but what are the, the few days ahead of you going to look like? Well, I tried to re uh, relax and rest a little bit because I worked uh, very, very hard um, the time before that, and I'm planning to work very hard uh, uh, starting from now, basically, again. So the last few days, I was, um, I was a bit worried that I'm going to be, you know, too much focused on the candidates and it's going to be nothing nothing else to think about, but uh, that wasn't at all the case. I mean, there were, with all the, you know, with, with all the fuss and the uh, issues that the uh, famous virus situation uh, brought us, it was quite easy to get distracted. So, dis not distract, but to get distracted. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, in that sense, uh, I definitely lost some focus uh, of my chest, which was which was good because uh, now I'm, I'm feeling more fresh and I can go back in. You know, if everything gets canceled, this will be the last result in chess for the next few months. So that could be really good publicity. That, that for you, Eric, yeah. the most recent, exactly. There's nothing else to talk about. Well, hopefully, uh, you know, the situation gets better. Thank you to both for your time and for excellent chess. And we wish you luck in the uh, Pro Chess League finals. And Anish, of course, good skill coming up in the candidates. We'll all be watching and uh, you know, eagerly anticipating your performance. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Of course. And we have our money game in the books. It was Ali Reza Faruja against Ray Robson. So the uh, that was the game that decided who won the $50, who won some of the, um, the membership prizes. And we see that, as of course, 
Levy, how surprised are you of the winner of this fifty dollars? Uh, terribly surprised. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> man, I just want to. I I could uh like that 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 was that was a fun interview. It's a shame, you know, we got like you know, two questions and then we gotta gotta let the guys go. Um, we're gonna you know obviously take a take one final look. I think at the filled out bracket. Uh, the, the bras do make it. They are the fourth team this year. It's three years in a row now that we've had uh, a different fourth team to, you know, to, to accompany St. Louis, Armenia, uh, and China. But this time, Armenia will be taking on the bras already ahead of time. Uh, the bra, uh, the, sorry, Armenia Eagles fielded a completely unique lineup. I mean, there was no Shant, there was no Haik. Like, these are the people, the heart and soul of the team that Parham on board one. And they had Tigran Petrosian, who's obviously super, super good blitz player, but not really the heart and soul of the team, right? You've got Zavin, who really is, and then he's usually surrounded by this, these young guys, uh, super experienced. So, uh, Robert, you know, uh, what, do you, what do you think is going to play out here uh, in the final? What do you think we can expect? And uh, who's going to win it all this year? Well, Tigran is the heart and soul of the Armenian nation when it comes to chess, but it's just the other Tigran Petrosian, the former world champion. But we've seen two straight days of just – incredible performances by people that you might not expect it to be from because as you mentioned when you think about the armenia lineup you think about uh, shant hike um, zavin uh, parham these guys and it came from tigran petrosian and here today eric hansen who is the face of the chess bra brand but has as he said himself he's shown some good results but some bad results he's streaky it was his day and i think going forward to the uh, finals the chess bras are heavily favored against armenia and it's, to me it's a true toss-up between china and st louis lee chow was interviewed the other day and he said to us oh no st louis is the big favorite i am not so sure of that when you have dingley ren yu yang yi wei yi and lee chow as your four boards i can't think of you know really any lineup imaginable that's would make them a heavy underdog even if they are the slight underdog compared to st louis but all that said it's been a really fun quarterfinals the semifinals i think four teams that are very deserving of their spot and levy it was a fun day commentating with you eric hansen became a legend in front of our eyes and what are your uh, final thoughts about today final thoughts are that uh well it's, it's good that we have no rating cap at the very beginning of the season uh this was kind of a more or less expected final four uh, I'm pumped. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to see Eric Hansen continue, uh, to, you know, his, his fantastic run in the next two matchups. And you know, we obviously have now this usual break that we have before, before the uh, semis and the finals. But in a couple of days, we will have coverage right here on this channel of the Candidates Tournament where Mr. Geary, Mr. Grishuk, and others will be participating. Make sure to tune into that. We will have an all-star lineup of commentators. And till then, friends, Pro Chess League and this channel is signing off. And the Chess Bros will get the raid, so don't go anywhere. They're going to have a celebratory stream. It will be a lot of fun. Stay safe, everybody. That's of the utmost importance. And I'm wishing everybody sincerely well. So uh, please you know, be advised and follow the recommendations. And happy chessing in the meantime.